Welcome to Sleep Scribe, your one-stop destination for audiobooks, sleep stories, and relaxing background music. My name is Iris. Today, we return to part two of the audiobook The Sword in the Stone, following the young ward on his exciting journey to become King Arthur. In part two, Arthur has grown under the tutelage of the wizard Merlin. He is unaware of his true identity but his courage and compassion shine through. Now, take a deep breath and relax your body. Close your eyes and focus on your breathing. Let go of all your thoughts and worries, be present in the moment, and listen the Sword in the Stone audiobook to explore the fascinating details of King Arthur's magical and mythical journey. So why not take a deep breath Hit subscribe, and let Sleep Scribe take you on a journey of relaxation and tranquility. Chapter 11 They passed the morning pleasantly, getting accustomed to two of Maid Marian's bows. Robin had insisted on this, saying that no man could shoot with another's bow any more than he could cut with another scythe. For their midday meal they had cold venison patty with mead, as also did everybody else. The outlaws drifted in for the meal like a conjuring trick. At one moment there would be nobody on the edge of the clearing, at the next half a dozen right inside it. Greener sunburnt men who had silently materialized out of the bracken or the trees. In the end there were about a hundred of them, eating merrily and laughing. The food was dished out from a leafy bower, where Marion and her attendants cooked. The outlaws usually posted a sentry to take the tree messages and slept during the afternoon. Partly because so much of their hunting had to be done in the times when most workmen sleep, and partly because generally the wild beasts take a nap in the afternoon, and so should their hunters. This afternoon, however, Robin called them to council. Now, men, he said, when they had assembled, you know about these anthropophagi, and how we have lost Matthew, Peter, Walter, Colin and many others. God rest their souls. You know how Guido found their nest last week. Tonight the anthropophagi are holding one of their feasts of sacrifice, and it behoves us to slay them at it. All the men made a deep murmur at this. I have much to tell you, men continued Robin in the success of our plan certainly, the safety of all our lives possibly, depends upon your listening. You know the anthropophagi, and how many varieties they have. The Scythians, who wrap themselves in their ears can hear a twig break half a mile away. The Pitanese, who live by smell, can detect a man upwind for three miles. The Nissites, with three or four eyes, can distinguish the faintest movement anywhere. All these men, or beasts if you prefer to call them so, are wild, ferocious and desperate. They are armed with poison arrows. Many of them, particularly the Cyapodes, are much swifter of foot than we can ever be. Our chances are small. Men, our hope is to take them by surprise. If we can surround them in the darkness, while their attention is all concentrated upon the fires of their sacrifice, we may be able to get within bow shot without being heard or scented or seen. Then, while they stand in the firelight and we in gloom, the difference between poison arrows and English cloth yards will be evened up. It is a dastardly way to fight. None of us likes it. But remember that these creatures are poisonous and cannibals. At that very moment they will be preparing to eat two servants of our neighbor Sir Ector. Remember also that on their own ground they are invincible, that our only hope of ourselves escaping from their slow decimation is by surprise. It will be difficult enough considering their acute senses even to surround them. This will need all our woodcraft. They must be slaughtered everyone tonight. Not one wasp or adder shall I call him must escape our shafts. 
Now, men, there will be five troops. Their leaders will be Marion, John Little, Much the Miller's son, Will Scatholic and myself. Friar Tuck will stay at the tree as lookout. These five troops will move individually for the first stage, each man for himself, until we are met at the great oak that was struck in the storm year. That oak is four miles away from the nest, and downwind of it, as the air lies at present, we must hope it will not change. After the great oak the men will separate into their bands, my own band, and John Little's going 400 yards to the left and right. It will be dark by then. The other three bands will spread into a semicircle. And, after giving us a start of twenty rosaries, we'll advance upon the nest upwind. Once more, and for the last time, I must warn every man that a Pitanese can smell three miles, the Scythians hear a twig at half a mile, and the Nissites see like hawks in every direction. My band and John Littles will be advancing on your wings, a few hundred yards in front. It will be the business of these two bands to close in upon the anthropophagy from the other side. It will be these bands who will be heard or scented sooner or later, for it will be their necessity to go upwind of the nest. We must hope that they will not be scented too soon. The other three bands will take up their stations on the downward side of the sacrificial fire, close enough for shooting point blank, but far enough to be invisible in the firelight. They will wait for news of my band and John's. If we manage to take up a good position on the other side undetected, I shall blow my horn. This will be the signal for all to fire. If we do not manage to take up a good position, but disturb the anthropophagy, that disturbance may also be taken as an order to fire. We shall have to surround them then, each man for himself again, as best we may. These two boys will go with Marion's band. I think that is all. No, there is one thing. If you can distinguish them in the firelight I want you to spare the Pitanese and the Indians. They are perfectly harmless. You know what they look like. That is all, men. Remember the silence of the woods and move like them. God bless us. Now then. As soon as Robin Wood had finished his speech which was listened to in perfect silence, an odd thing happened. He began it again at the beginning and spoke it from start to finish in exactly the same words. On finishing it for the second time, he said, Now captains and all those hundred men, split into groups of twenty which went to different parts of the clearing, and stood round Marion, Little John, Much, Scarlet and Robin. From each of these little groups a humming noise rose to the sky. What on earth are they doing? asked Kay. Listen, said the wart. They were repeating the speech word for word. Probably none of them could read or write, but they had learned to listen and to remember. This was the way in which Robin kept touch with his raiders by night, by knowing that each man knew by heart all that the leader himself knew, and why he was able to trust them, when necessary, to move each man by himself. When all the men had repeated their instructions, and every one was word perfect in that long speech, there was an issue of war arrows, a dozen to each man. These arrows had bigger heads, ground to razor sharpness, and they were heavily feathered in a square cut. There was a bow inspection, and two or three men were issued with new strings. Then all fell silent. Now then cried Robin cheerfully. He waved his arms in a generous gesture. And the men, smiling, raised their bows in salute. Then there was a sigh, a rustle, a snap of one incautious twig, and the clearing of the giant lime tree was as empty as it had been before the days of man. Come with me, said Marion, touching the boys on the shoulder. Behind them the bees hummed in the leaves. It was a long march and a tedious one. The artificial glades which converged upon the lime tree in the form of a cross were no longer of use after the first half hour. After that they had to make their way through the virgin forest as best they might. It would not have been so bad if they had been able to kick and slash their way through it. But they were supposed to move in silence. Maid Marion showed them how to go sideways, one side after the other, how to stop at once when a bramble caught them, and take it patiently out, 
how to put their feet down sensitively, and then roll their weight to that leg as soon as they were certain that no twig was under the foot, how to distinguish at a glance the places which gave most hope of an easy passage, and how a kind of rhythm in their movements would help them in spite of all these obstacles, although there were a hundred invisible men on every side of them moving towards the same goal, they heard no sounds but their own. The boys had felt a little disgruntled at first, at being put into Marion's band. They would have preferred to have gone with Robin, and thought that being put under Marion was like being entrusted to a governess. They soon found out their mistake. She had objected to their coming, but now that their coming was ordered she accepted them as companions in war nor was it easy to be a companion of hers. In the first place it was impossible to keep up with her, unless she waited for them, for she could move on all fours, or even wriggle like a snake almost as quickly as they could walk, and in the second place she was an accomplished soldier, which they were not. One of the bits of advice which she gave them before talking had to be stopped was this, aim high when you shoot in war, rather than low. A low arrow strikes only the ground, a high one may kill in the second rank. If I am ever made to get married thought the ward, who had doubts on this subject, I will marry a girl like this, a kind of golden vixen. As a matter of fact, though the boys did not know it, Marion could hoot like an owl by blowing into her fists, or whistle that shrill blast between tongue and teeth with the fingers in the corner of the mouth could bring all the birds to her by imitating their calls and understand much of their small language, such as when the tits exclaim that a hawk is coming, could hit the papinje twice for three times of robins, and could turn cartwheels. But none of these accomplishments was necessary at the moment. The twilight fell mistily, it was the very first of the autumn mists, and in the dimity, the undispersed families of the tawny owl called to each other, the young with kiwik and the old with the proper haru, haru, proportionately as the brambles and obstacles became harder to see, so did they become easier to feel. It was odd, but in the deepening silence the wart found himself able to move more silently, instead of the reverse. Being reduced to touch and sound he found himself in better accord with these, and could go quietly and quick. It was about compline, or, as we should call it, at nine o'clock at night, and they had covered at least seven miles of that toilsome forest. When Marion touched Kay on the shoulder and pointed into the blue darkness, they could see in the dark now, as well as human beings can see in it, and much better than townspeople will ever manage to, and there in front of them, struck through seven miles of trackless forest by Marion's woodcraft, was the smitten oak. They decided with one accord, without even a whisper, to creep up to it so silently, that even the members of their own army, who might already be waiting there, would not know of their arrival. They crept, but a motionless man has always the advantage of a man in motion, and they had hardly reached the outskirts of the roots, when friendly hands took hold of them, patted their backs with pats as light as thistle down, and guided them to seats. The roots were crowded, it was like being a member of a band of starlings, or of roosting rooks. In the night mystery a hundred men breathed on every side of wart, like the surge of our own blood which we can hear when we are writing or reading in the late and lonely hours. They were in the dark and stilly womb of night. Presently the wart noticed that the grasshoppers were creaking their shrill note, so tiny as to be almost extra audible, like the creak of the bat. They creaked one after another. They creaked, and when Marion had creaked thrice in order to account for Kay and wart as well as for herself, one hundred times, all the outlaws were present, and it was time to go. There was a rustle, as if the wind had moved in the last few leaves of that 900-year-old oak, then an owl hooted soft, a field mouse screamed, a rabbit thumped, a dog fox barked his deep, single lion's cough, and an aeromouse twittered above their heads. The leaves rustled again more lengthily while you could count a hundred and then made Marion, 
who had done the rabbit's thump, was surrounded by her band of twenty plus two. The wart felt a man on either side of him take his hand as they stood in a circle, and then he noticed that the stridulation of the grasshoppers had begun again. It was going round in a circle towards him, and as the last grasshopper rubbed its legs together, the man on his right squeezed his hand. Wart stridulated. Instantly the man on his left did the same and pressed his hand also. There were 22 grasshoppers before Maid Marian's band was ready for its last stalk of four miles through the silent forest. The last stalk might have been a nightmare, but to the ward it was heavenly. Suddenly he found himself filled with an exultation of might and felt that he was bodiless, silent, or transported. He felt that he could have walked upon a feeding rabbit and caught her up by the ears furry and kicking before she knew his presence. He felt that he could have run between the legs of the men on either side of him or taken their bright daggers from their sheaths while they still moved on and dreaming. The passion of nocturnal secrecy was a wine that triumphed in his blood. He really was small and young enough to move as secretly as the warriors. Their age and weight made them lumber, in spite of all their woodcraft, and his youth and lightness made him mobile, in spite of his lack of it. It was an easy stalk, except for its added danger. The bushes thinned out and the sounding bracken grew rarely in the swampy earth, so that they could move three times as fast. They went in a dream, unguided by owls hoot or bats twitter, but only kept together by the necessary pace which the sleeping forest imposed upon them. Some of them were fearful, some revengeful for their lost comrades, some, as it were, disbodied in the horrible sleepwalk of their stealth. There was a glimmer in front of them, a rosy sunrise in the trees. There were noises and shadows that moved before it. Something like a queer phantasmagoria of village celebrations, which have been seen in these late years of grace for jubilee and coronations. There was a clearing lit by firelight, and in it huts of mud. Their round walls were saffron in the glow, beehives of light and darkness, and three stakes or spits stood in the center of the night. The wild men intended to roast poor Cavill as well as the dog boy in Watt, and the third stake was for him. Wart could see the firelight gleaming red from the coating of Maid Marian's eye as she fitted the knock of her arrow to the string. But the people in the nest of anthropophagy were more strange than all. They were busy about their tasks of roasting, plainly visible to their slayers in the outer gloom. Some with their heads growing beneath their shoulders, ran about their errands of torture with set expressions, like people intent upon something they have lost upon the ground. Others, with the heads of dogs, howled with slow melodious accents before the fire. The pygmy Spythemae, whose eternal enemies are cranes, ran about with tiny logs for the roast, themselves only a few hands high. The Ethiopians or Cyapodes had only one foot, but this is so huge that they could use it as a sunshade to protect themselves when sleeping. These creatures hopped on their single feet with incredible agility, like hares landing on their heels and taking off with their toes in industrious bounds, which were directed towards conveying all the necessaries for the sacrifice. Some of the men had lower lips so large that they could cover their heads with them to keep off the rain, others had six fingers or eight toes, others again, the Nissites were glaring in all directions from four eyes, bloodshot by the bonefire light, while the women among them had long beards but were quite bald. Perhaps the most curious of all these flame-fringed cannibals were the storkmen, creatures with beautiful human bodies, but the necks, heads and beaks of the heron family. They moved before the hellish tapestry poking their heads forwards and back tick-tock like a metronome as they balanced their beaks against the forward pace. In a far corner of the clearing, by a stream, distant from all this business, the Indians and Pitanese or a stones were clustered, the former innocuous water mammals like Manates, who were covered with hair, had six hands, and lived only by browsing in the stream, the latter a timid race who had no mouths. 
but existed entirely upon what they smelled and who could be slain by a stink. All these, with the Scythians who were accustomed to wrap themselves up in their ears at night, moved in the strange light of the sacrificial flame. The boys lay and listened with their troop for a time which seemed eternity. They fitted their arrows to their strings, so that they would be ready to loose off at the very first note of Robin's horn, but no sound came. Only the cruel uproar of the nest came to them down the wind. They saw the poor dog boy and old Watt let out to their stakes, and Cavill also, howling dismally. He was terrified by the dog-headed men, whom he supposed to be demons. The dog boy seemed very angry and anxious to fight his captors in spite of his bonds, but old Watt did not know what was being done to him and walked between two Scythians with a happy smile. He, unlike Cavill, believed that he was in the hands of angels. The huge ears of the Scythians, moving like wings, made him think this. The victims were tied to their stakes, and the faggots piled about them. Then the anthropophagy joined hands in a circle, and began to prance round and round the sacrifice, as if they were doing a Paul Jones. They shouted, squealed, hooted, honked or barked as they pranced, according to the several natures of their heads. The stork men jerked their sharp beaks backwards and forwards quicker and quicker, looking very strange in their tallness as they skipped perhaps hand in hand with one of the pygmies. The cyapodes went kerthump kerthump, bounding on their huge and single feet. It was a terrible spectacle. The wart was watching one of the Nissites who appeared to be the leader of the band partly on account of his enormous size and four red eyes, partly because he carried the sacrificial bow which would be used to dispatch the victims as soon as their faggots had been truly lit when the Paul Jones stopped of its own accord. There had been no sound of movement which the outlaws could distinguish, but suddenly the dance was stilled. For a moment the Nissites shaded all their eyes and frowned into the darkness on the other side of the clearing, while the Scythians, unfolding their elephant ears, stood in black silhouettes and waved them sensitively in the same direction. Then the poor Pitanizera stones huddles at the far end of the settlement and taking no parts in these barbaric orgies set up a dreadful wail through their twitching noses and stampeded. There were shrieks and a terrible din of animal voices on top of the uproar and riding on it proudly like the voice of an Arabian bird, Robin Wood's fierce horn of silver began to blow. Tone ton taven tontavin tan tontavin tontin tontavin went the horn, and again, moot trout trout it out trout out it out, trout trout, tran 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 tran. Robin was blowing his hunting music, and now all the ambushed archers leaped up. They set forward their left foot in the same movement and let fly such a shower of arrows as it had been snow. The wart saw the leader of the Nissite stagger in his tracks, a clothyard shaft suddenly sprouting from between his shoulder blades. He saw his own arrow fly white of a crane man, and eagerly bent forward to snatch another from the ground. Each man of the waiting troops had stuck his twelve arrows point downwards in the ground before him for convenience in loading. He saw the rank of his companion archers sway forward as if by a preconcerted signal, when each man stooped for a second shaft. He heard the bow strings twang again, the purr of the feathers in the air. He saw the phalanx of arrows gleam like an eye flick in the firelight. All his life up to then he had been shooting into straw targets which made a noise like fud. He had often longed to hear the noise that these gay, true, clean and deadly missiles of the air would make in solid flesh. He heard it. The anthropophagi were yelling, falling and running about. Some had snatched up their poisonous bows and were firing wildly into the dark. Others, strangely transfixed, were tumbling with their ears pinned to their bodies or their lips to their chests. The pygmies scuttled for the huts. The Scythians made a trumpeting noise and charged the dark. They ran madly upon their assailants, but stumbled, coughed or barked, and fell on their faces or sat down backwards in a few yards. As they leapt out the arrows leapt to meet them. The cyapodes, more swift in flight, 
found it towards the sheltering darkness in skips of 20 or 30 feet, one of them coming straight at the ward. He could see the pointed ears, the wild eyes slit like a cat's, and the one huge foot by whose action it bounded. It squealed as it came and let fly one of its poison arrows at random. It saw the ward and leapt into the air like a kangaroo. The ward was fitting an arrow to his bow. The cock feather would not go right. Everything was in slow motion once again. He saw the huge body flying blackly through the glare, felt the foot take him in the chest. He felt himself turning somersaults on top of him. He saw Kay's face somewhere in the cartwheel of the universe, flushed with flame-lit excitement and made Marion's on the other side with its mouth open, shouting something. He thought, before he slid into blackness, that it was shouting something nice. Chapter 12. They picked the ward out from under the cyapod and found his arrow sticking through its chest. It had died in its leap, ward was unconscious, and the battle was over. Then there was a time which made him feel sick while Robin set his broken collarbone and made him a sling out of the green cloth of his hood, and after that all lay down indiscriminately to sleep dog tired among the slain. The wart lay propped against a tree. It was too late to get back to the castle that night, or even to get back to the outlaws camp by the lime tree. All that could be done was to make up the fires, post sentries, and sleep where they were. Wart did not sleep much. He leant against his tree, watching the red sentries pass to and fro in the firelight, hearing their quiet passwords, and thinking about the excitements of the day. These went round and round in his head, sometimes losing their proper order and happening backwards or by bits. He saw the leaping cyapod, heard Marion shouting good shot, listened to the humming of the bees muddled up with the stridulation of the grasshoppers, and shot and shot, hundreds and thousands of times, at papinjays which turned into cyapodes. Kay and the liberated dog boy slept twitching beside him, looking alien and incomprehensible as people do when they are asleep, and Cavill, lying at his good shoulder, occasionally licked his hot cheeks. The dawn came slowly, so slowly and pausingly that it was quite impossible to determine when it really had dawned, as is its habit during the summer months. Well, said Robin, when they had all wakened and eaten the breakfast of bread and cold venison which they had brought with them, you will have to love us and leave us Kay. Otherwise I shall have Sir Ector fitting out an expedition against me to fetch you back. Thank you both for your help. Can I give you any little present as a reward for it? It has been lovely said Kay. Absolutely lovely. Can I have the Scythian I shot? He will be a bit heavy to carry. Why not just take his head? That would do said Kay, if somebody wouldn't mind cutting it off. It was that Scythian there. What are you going to do about old what? Asked the wart. It depends on his preferences. Perhaps he will like to run off by himself and eat acorns, as he used to do, or if he likes to join our band, we shall be glad of him. He ran away from your village in the first place so I don't suppose he will care to go back there. What do you think? If you are going to give me a present said the wart slowly, I should like to have him. Do you think that would be alright? As a matter of fact said Robin, I don't. I don't think you can very well give people as presents, they might not like it. What did you intend to do with him? Oh. I don't want to keep him or anything like that. You see, we have a tutor who is a pretty good magician, and I thought he might be able to restore Watt to his wits. Good boy said Robin, have him by all means. I'm sorry I made a mistake. At least, we'll ask him if he would like to go. When somebody had gone off to fetch what Robin said, you had better talk to him yourself. They brought the poor old man, smiling, confused, hideous and very dirty, and stood him up before Robin. Go on said Robin. The wart did not know quite how to put it, but he said, I say, what, would you like to come home with me, please, just for a little? Anan and Alwarabitha said what, pulling his forelock, smiling, bowing and gently waving his arms in various directions. Come with me? Wananana Wanawana. 
dinner? Asked the ward in desperation. Yum, 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 cried the poor creature affirmatively, and his eyes glowed with pleasure at the prospect of being given something to eat. That way said the wart, pointing in the direction which he knew by the sun to be that of his guardian's castle. Dinner, come with, I take. Meester said what, suddenly remembering just one word, the word which he had always been accustomed to offer to the great people who made him a present of food, his only livelihood. It was concluded, well said Robin, it has been a good adventure, and I'm sorry you're going, I hope I shall see you again one day. Come any time said Marion, if you are feeling bored, you have only to follow those glades. And you, Wart, be careful of that collarbone for a few days. I will send some men with you to the edge of the chase said Robin, after that you must go by yourselves, I expect the dog boy can carry the Scythian's head. Goodbye said Kay, goodbye said Robin, goodbye said the Wart. Goodbye said Marion smiling, and always shoot like you did last night. Goodbye cried all the outlaws, waving their bows. And Kay and the ward and the dog boy and Wad and Cavill and their escort, set off on a long track home. They had an immense reception, the return on the previous day of all the hounds except Cavill and the dog boy, and in the evening the failure to return of Kay and the ward had set the household in an uproar. Their nurse had gone into hysterics, Hop had stayed out till midnight scouring the purlieus of the forest, the cooks had burnt the joint for dinner, and the sergeant at arms had polished all the armor twice and sharpened all the swords and axes to a razor blade in expectation of an immediate invasion. At last somebody had thought of consulting Merlin, whom they had found in the middle of his third nap. The magician, for the sake of peace and quietness to go on with his nap in, had used his insight to tell Sir Actor exactly what the boys were doing, where they were, and when they might be expected to come back. He had prophesied their return to the minute. So, when the small procession of returning warriors came within sight of the drawbridge, they were greeted by the entire household. Sir Ector was standing in the middle with a thick walking stick, with which he proposed to whack them for going out of bounds and causing so much trouble. The nurse had insisted on bringing out a banner which used to be put up when Sir Ector came home for the holidays as a small boy, and the said welcome home, Hob had forgotten all about his beloved hawks, and was standing on one side, shading his eagle eyes to get the first view. The cooks and all the kitchen staff were banging pots and pans, and singing will ye no come back again, out of tune, the kitchen cat was yelling, the hounds had escaped from the kennel, because there was nobody to look after them, and were preparing to chase the kitchen cat, the sergeant at arms was blowing out his chest with pleasure so far that he looked as if he might burst at any moment and was commanding everybody in a very important voice to get ready to cheer when he said one two one two cried the sergeant huzza cried everybody obediently including sir ector look what i've got shouted k i've shot a scythian and the ward has been wounded yo 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 barked all the hounds and poured over the dog boy licking his face, scratching his chest, sniffing him all over to see what he had been up to, and looking hopefully at the Scythian's head which the dog boy held high in the air, so that they could not eat it. Bless my soul exclaimed Sir Ector. Alas, the poor Philip Sparrow cried the nurse, dropping her banner, pity his poor arm all too brassed and a green sea him. It's all right said the wart, ah, uh, don't catch hold of me, it hurts. May I have it stuffed? asked Kay. Well, I be done said Hob. Then thick wolf chappy or what? That erst run lunatical? My dear, dear boys said Sir Ector. I am so glad to see you back. Wolf chucklehead exclaimed the nurse triumphantly. Where be thy girt cudgel now? Hem, said Sir Ector. How dare you go out of bounds and put us all to this anxiety? It's a real Scythian said Kay. 
Who knew there was nothing to be afraid of? I shot dozens of them. Wart shot a psyopod and broke his collarbone. We rescued the dog boy and what? That comes of teaching the young Hidia how to shoot, said the sergeant proudly. Sir Ector kissed the boys and commanded the Scythian to be displayed before him. Well, he exclaimed, what a monster, we'll have him stuffed in the dining hall. What did you say his measurements were? 82 inches from ear to ear. Robin said it might be a record. We shall have to write to the field. It is rather a good one, isn't it? Remarked Kay with studied calm. I shall have it set up by Roland Ward Sir Ector went on in high delight, with a little ivory card with Kay's first anthropophagus on it in black letters and the date. Era, lead thy childishness exclaimed the nurse. Now master art, my innocent, be off with thee to thy bed upon the instant. And thou, Sir Ector, let thee think shame to be playing why monsters heads like a godwit. When the poor child stays upon the point of death, now, sergeant, leave puffing of thy chest, stir, man, and take horse to Cardoyle for the chirurgeon. She waved her apron at the sergeant, who collapsed his chest and retreated like a shoot chicken. It's all right, said the wart. I tell you, it is only a broken collarbone, and Robin said it for me last night. It doesn't hurt a bit. Leave the boy, nurse commanded Sir Ector taking sides with the men against the women and anxious to re-establish his superiority after the matter of the cudgel. Merlin will see to him if he needs it, no doubt. Who is this Robin? Robin Wood cried both the boys together. Never heard of him. You call him Robin Hood, explained Kay in superior tones. But it's wood really, like the wood that he's the spirit of. Well, 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 so you've been foraging with the rascal. Come in to breakfast, boys, and tell me all about him. We've had breakfast, said the wart, hours ago. May I please take what with me to see Merlin? Why, it's the old man who went wild and started rootin' in the forest. Wherever did you get hold of him? The anthropophagy had captured him with the dog boy and cavil. They were going to eat them, roasted. But we shot them K put in. I shot a hundred. So now I want to see if Merlin can restore him to his wits. Master Art said the nurse sternly. She had been breathless up to now on account of Sir Ector's rebuke. Master Art, thy room and thy bed is where thou art tending to, and at this instant, wold fools may be wold fools, whether by yea or by nay, but I can't serve the family for fifty years without a learning of my duty. I flibberty gibberting about why a lot of want wits, when thy own arm may be dropping to the floor at any moment. Yes, thou wold turkey cock she added turning fiercely upon Sir Ector. And thou canst keep thy magician away from the poor mite's room till he's rested, that thou canst. A wantoning why monsters and lunaticals continued the victor as she led her helpless captive from the stricken field. I never heard the like. Please someone to tell Merlin to look after what cried the victim over his shoulder, in diminishing tones. Pop the guys, indeed they heard her concluding, I'll give him pop the guys. The wart woke up in his cool bed, feeling better. The dear old fire eater who looked after him, had covered the windows with a curtain, so that the room was dark and comfortable. But he could tell by the one ray of sunlight which shot golden across the floor that it was late afternoon, he not only felt better, he felt very well indeed, so well that it was quite impossible to stay in bed. He moved quickly to throw back the sheet, but stopped with a hiss at the creak or scratch of his shoulder, which he had forgotten about in his sleep. Then he got out more carefully, by sliding down the bed and pushing himself upright with one hand, shoved his bare feet into a pair of slippers and managed to wrap a dressing gown round him more or less. He padded off through the stone passages up the worn circular stairs to find Merlin. When he reached the schoolroom, he found that Kay was continuing his first-rate education. 
he was evidently doing dictation, for as Ward opened the door, he heard Merlin pronouncing in measured tones, sign presentes et futuri quad and k saying, wait a bit, my pen has gone all squeegee, you'll catch it remarked k, when he saw him, you're supposed to be in bed, dying of gangrene or something, Merlin said the wart, what have you done with what? You should try to speak without assonances said Merlin. For instance, the beer is never clear near here, dear is unfortunate even as an assonance. And then again, your sentence is ambiguous to say the least of it. What what? I might reply taking it to be a conundrum, or if I were King Pelliner, what what? What? Nobody can be too careful about their habits of speech. K had evidently been doing his dictation well. And the old gentleman was in good humor. You know what I mean said the wart. What have you done with the old man with no nose? He's cured him said Kay. Well said Merlin, you might call it that. And there again you might not. Of course, when one has lived in the world as long as I have, and backwards at that. One does learn to know a thing or two about pathology. The wonders of analytical psychology and plastic surgery are. I am afraid to this generation, but a closed book, he leant back in high delight. What did you do to him? Oh, I just psychoanalyzed him, you know said Merlin grandly, that, and of course I sewed on a new nose on both of them. What kind of nose? asked the wart. It's too funny said Kay. He wanted to have the Scythian's nose for one, but I wouldn't let him. So then he took the noses off two young pigs which we are going to have for supper, and used those. Personally I think they will both grunt. A ticklish operation said Merlin, but a successful one. Well said Wart doubtfully. I hope it will be alright. What did they do then? They went off to the kennels together. Old Watt is very sorry for what he did to the dog boy, but he says he can't remember having done it. He says that suddenly everything went black when they were throwing stones once, and he can't remember anything since. The dog boy forgave him and said he didn't mind a bit. They are going to work together in the kennels in future and not think of what's past anymore. The dog boy says that the old man was very good to him while they were prisoners of the anthropophagy, and that he knows he ought not to have thrown stones at him in the first place. He says he often thought about that when the other boys were throwing stones at him. Well said the wart, I'm glad it's all turned out for the best. Do you think I could go and visit them? For heaven's sake don't do anything to annoy your nurse exclaimed Merlin, looking about him anxiously. That old woman hit me with a broom when I came to see you this forenoon and broke my spectacles. Couldn't you wait until tomorrow? On the morrow Watt and the dog boy were the firmest of friends. Their common experiences of being stoned by a mob and then sacrificed by cannibals served as a bond and a topic of reminiscence as they lay among the dogs at night for the rest of their lives and by the morning. They had both pulled off the noses which Merlin had so kindly given them. They explained that they had got used to having no noses, now, and anyway, they preferred to live with the dogs. Chapter 13 The summer was over at last, and nobody could deny any longer that the autumn was definitely there. It was that rather sad time of year when for the first time for many months the fine old sun still blazes away in a cloudless sky, but does not warm you, and the hoar frosts and the mists and the winds begin to stir their faint lens at morning and evening with the gossamer, as the sap of winter vigor remembers itself in the cold corpses which brave summer slew. The leaves were still on the trees and still green, but it was the leaden green of old leaves which have seen much since the gay colors and happiness of spring, that seems so lately and, like all happy things, 
so quickly to have passed, the sheep fairs had been held, the plums had tumbled off the trees in the first big winds and here and there, in the lovely sunlight too soon enfeebled, a branch of beech or oak was turning yellow, the one to die quickly and mercifully, the other perhaps to hold grimly to the frozen tree, and to hiss with its papery skeletons, all through the east winds of winter, until the spring was there again. The wart's arm did not hurt any more, but he was not allowed to do his martial exercises under the sergeant at arms in the afternoons, for fear of spoiling it before it was properly mended. He went for walks instead kept watch on a playful family of five hobbies who shouted cooey 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 and would be migrating any day now they were late already, and he collected the enormous caterpillars of moths, which had been through all their changes, and now sought lumberingly for a convenient place in which to turn into the chrysalis. His best capture was the four-inch plum and apricot upholstery of a goat moth which buried itself quite cheerfully among trails of silk in a box of loose earth which he kept beside his bed. It had taken three years to reach its present size and would lie purdue for another before the big dun moth crept out of its old armor and pumped the blood into the veins of its expanding wings. Merlin caught a male grass snake on one of these walks. They met by chance face to face as each was turning the corner of a big bed of seeded nettles from opposite directions, and the magician pounced upon the reptile before it had time to flick its black tongue twice. He held it up, wriggling, hissing and smelling strongly of acetylene, while the ward examined it in horror. Don't be afraid of it, said Merlin. It is only a piece of olive lightning with a otter V behind its shining black head. It can't sting you and won't bite you. It has never done harm to anybody and can only flee and stink. See, he said, and began stroking it from the head downwards, a touch which the poor creature tried to evade but soon accepted in its ceaseless efforts to pour and pour away. Everybody kills them, said Merlin indignantly. Some by Our Lady Fool once said that you could tell an adder because it had a V on its head which stood for viper. It would take you five minutes to find the mark on an adder's head anyway, but these helpless beauties with their bright yellow-black bordered V get bashed to death in consequence. Here, catch hold of him. The wart took the serpent gingerly into his hands, taking care to hold it well away from the vent from which the white smell came. He had thought that snakes were slimy as well as dangerous, but this was not. It was dry as a piece of living rope, and had, like rope, a pleasing texture to the fingers on account of its scales. Every ounce of it was muscle, every plate of its belly was a strong moving foot. He had held toads before, and they, the fat philosophical warty creatures, had been a little clammy on account of their loose flesh. This creature, on the other hand, was dry and delicately rough and liquid power. It was the same temperature as the ground on which it basked. You ask to be turned into a snake once, said Merlin. Do you still want that? Yes, please. It isn't much of a life. I don't think you'll get anything very exciting to happen to you. This chap probably only eats about once a week or once a fortnight, and the rest of the time he dreams. Still, if I turned you into one, you might get into talk. It won't be more than that. I should like it all the same. Well, it will be a rest after shooting anthropophagy. Merlin loosed the grass snake, which immediately flashed off into the nettles. Then he exchanged a few words in Greek with an invisible gentleman called Aesculapius and turned to the wart. He said, I shall stay here for an hour or two, and perhaps I shall sit down against that tree and have a nap. Then I want you to come out to me when I call you. Goodbye. The wart tried to say goodbye, but found that he was dumb. He looked quickly at his hands, but they were not there. Aesculapius had accepted and so gently that he had not noticed it, and he was lying on the ground. Poor off, then said Merlin. Go and search for him in the nettles. Some people say that snakes are deaf, 
and others that they deafen themselves in order to escape being charmed by music. The thoughtful adder, for instance, is said by many learned persons to lay one ear upon the ground and to stick the point of his tail into the other, so that he cannot hear your music. Ward found that as a matter of fact snakes were not deaf. He had an ear anyway, which was conscious of deep roaring sounds that were approximate to the noises which he had learnt as a boy. For instance if somebody bangs on the side of the bath or if the pipes begin to gurgle when your ears are underwater, you hear sounds which are different to those which would be heard in a normal position. But you would soon get accustomed to these sounds and connect the roaring and bumbling with water pipes if you kept your head underwater for long. In fact, although you heard a different kind of noise, you would still be hearing the pipes which human beings hear in the upper air. So the wart could hear what Merlin said, though it sounded very thin and high, and he therefore hoped to be able to talk to the snake. He darted out his tongue, which he used as a sort of feeler, such as the long stick with which an explorer might probe the bogs in front of him, and he slid off into the nettles in search of his companion. The other snake was lying flat on its face in a state of great agitation. It had managed to push itself into the very roots of the coarse grass among the nettles, for there is always a kind of empty layer between the green grass and the actual mud. The top green layer is supported on pillars of bleached roots, and it was in this secret acre huge chamber, which covers every grass field floored with mud and roofed with green, that the poor snake had sought concealment. It was lamenting to itself in a very sweet, cold, simple voice and crying, alas, alas. It is difficult to explain the way in which snakes talk except by this. Everybody knows that there are rays of light, the infrared and the ultraviolet and those beyond them in which ants for instance can see, and men cannot. Just so there are waves of sound higher than the bat's squeak, which Mozart once heard delivered by Lucrezia Ajigari in 1770, and lower than the distant thunder which pheasants hear. Or is it that they see the flash before man? It was in these profound melodious accents that the snake conversed. Who are you? Asked the snake trembling as Wart poured himself into the secret chamber beside it. Did you see the human? It was an H. Sapiens, I believe. I only just got away. It was in such a flutter that it did not wait for its question to be answered, but went on excitedly, oh, the horrid creature. Did you notice how it smelt? Well, I shan't go out again in a hurry, that I will say. Look what a mess I have got myself in. It was an H. sapiens barbatus, as far as I could see. They are quite common round here. You take my advice and lie close for a day or two. I just went out for a moment with the idea of getting a frog or two before hibernating, and it pounced upon me like a hedgehog. I don't believe I was ever so frightened in my life. Do you think it would be best to hibernate at once? I shouldn't worry said the wart. That particular human is fond of snakes, as I happen to know. To eat, stammered the serpent. No, no. He is friendly with them, and has some as pets. We he, I mean that is, he spends most of the botany hours looking for frogs to feed them on. It's wonderful how few frogs there are. Once you begin looking for them only toads. And of course snakes don't eat toads. I ate a toad once said the other, who was beginning to calm down. It was a small one, you know, but it wasn't very nice. Still, I don't think I should like to be a pet of that creature's however many frogs it caught. Do you happen to know its sex? It was a male said the wart. H. Sapiens Barbatus F. repeated the snake feeling safer now that he had got the subject classified. And what is your name, my child? The wart did not know what to answer, so he simply told the truth. It's a funny sort of name said the snake doubtfully. What is yours? asked the wart. T. Natrix. Does the T stand for anything? Well, not Tommy, said the snake rather coolly, if that's what you mean. It's Tropodonatus in my family always. I'm sorry. 
If you don't mind my saying so, remarked the snake, it seems to me that your education has been neglected. First you have a mother who calls you wart, just as if you were one of those vulgar buffonity, and then you can't distinguish a T-matrix when you see him. Did you never have a mother? As a matter of fact, I didn't. Oh, I am sorry exclaimed the snake. I hope I haven't hurt your feelings. Do you mean to say you never had anybody to teach you the legends and dreams and that? Never. You poor newt. What do you do then when you hibernate? I suppose I just go to sleep. And not dream? No said the wart. I don't think so. Not much. It turned out that T. Natrix was an affectionate and tender-hearted creature, for it now shed a small, clear tear through its nose and exclaimed indignantly, what a shame. Fancy the poor little reptile crawling into its lonely hole for all those months with not a mother to remember and not a single dream to keep it company. I suppose they haven't even taught you history? I know some history said the wart doubtfully about Alexander the Great and that some trashy modern stuff no doubt said the snake. How on earth you get through the winter I don't know. Did anybody tell you about Atlantosaurus Imminus and Ceratosaurus Nasicornis? I don't think so. Well, I don't know what to say. Couldn't you tell me about them yourself? It certainly seems the kindest thing to do replied the snake, and by Esculapius, I will do it too, if it takes me all the afternoon. Why, I should hardly be able to sleep the whole winter, thinking of you shivering in that hole with nothing to muse about. It would be very kind of you if you would, and I will said the gentle reptile. I will teach you the sort of thing that all snakes revolve in their small, slow, winter brains, what time the snow shuffles down outside, or for that matter in the summer too, as they snooze beside warm stones. Would you rather have history or legends? I think history said the wart. History murmured the snake drawing a film over its eyes because it could not close them. History, it repeated softly. Ah. I wonder said the snake after a minute, then it gave a gentle sigh and gave it up, you must forget about us it said absently, there is no history in me or you, we are individuals too small for our great sea to care for, that is why I don't have any special name, but only T. Matrix like all my forefathers before me, there is a little history in T. Matrix, but none in me. It stopped baffled by its own feelings, and then began again in its slow voice. There is one thing which all we snakes remember, child. Except for two people, we are the oldest in the world. Look at that ridiculous H. Sapiens Barbatus, which gave me such a fright just now. It was born when? 10 or 20,000 years ago. What do the tens and twenties matter? The earth cooled. The sea covered it. It was a hundred million years ago that life came to the great sea, and the fishes bred within it. They were the oldest people, the fish, their children climbed out of it and stood upon the bosky shores, and they were the amphibia like our friends the newts. The third people, who sprang from them, were the reptiles, of which we are one. Think of those old faces of the world upon which tea. Natrix moved in the slime and of the millions of years. Why, the birds which you see every day are our descendants. We are their parents, but can persist to live along with them. Do you mean that when you were born there were no birds or men? No birds or men, no monkeys or reindeer or elephants or any such animals. Only the amphibia and the reptiles and the fishes in the Mesozoic world. That's history added the snake thoughtfully. One of those H. Sapiens Barbatus F. Might think of that next time he murders T. Natrix for being a viper. There is something strange about the will of the sea. It is bound up with the history of my family. Did you ever hear the story of H. Sapiens Armidus Georgius Sanctus? I don't think I did said the wart. Once very long ago, when even T. Natrix was a young and hopeful, 
There were two families called Atlantosaurus Imminus and Ceratosaurus Nasicornis. Atlantosaurus was 115 feet long. He had not many brains, although I did hear once that he had something like an extra brain at the other end of him to take care of his tail, and he lived by browsing on the trees. He was timid, ruminant and harmless, except to the tree frogs which he munched by mistake among the boughs. He lived very long and thought all the time, so that, although he did not think very well, he had generally thought a good deal by the end of it. So far as I can remember, he had solved the problem of being a giant without breaking on account of his own weighty height of 20 feet by having his bones hollow. The birds do that too, you know, for other reasons. However, perhaps I am muddling him up with another of the Dinosauria. Ceratosaurus nasicornis was quite small. He was only 17 feet long, but he had teeth, great crushing and tearing teeth which fitted into each other so badly that he leapt always with his slaughterous mouth half open in a grin of terror. He leaped like a kangaroo, a death-dealing kangaroo, and he generally leaped upon poor Atlantosaurus imminus. He had a horn upon his nose, like a rhinoceros, with which he could rip an opening in that big trundling old body and his clashing teeth could meet in the flesh as in ripe fruit, and tear it out in mouthfuls by the action of his muscular neck. What is more terrible, he leaped in packs. Ceratosaurus nasicornis was at war with Atlantosaurus imminus, in that strange war which the spirit of the waters wills, the war of competition and evolution, which makes the trees fight upwards for the sun on the Amazon, and in the course of which, for the boon of life, many of my cousins have been content to sacrifice the benefits of limbs and teeth and eyesight. Ceratosaurus was savage and aggressive, Atlantosaurus timid and old. Their combat lasted for as many centuries as will be needed by H. Sapiens also, in which to destroy himself. At the end of that time it was the defender who triumphed. The ferocious kangaroo had dealt death on every side, had decimated his adversaries and fed upon their carcasses, but carcasses cannot continue their species, and in the end, the kangaroos had consumed the very flesh on which they lived. Too remorseless for the spirit of the waters, too bloodthirsty for the hierarchy of progressive victims, the last Ceratosaurus roamed the thick-leaved jungles in a vain search for the food which could satisfy his gnashing jaws, then died and slept with his fathers. The last Atlantosaurus thrust her forty-foot neck out of the jungle in which she had been hiding and surveyed the emaciated corpse of her starved persecutor. She had preserved her life, as the sensible wood pigeon does, by specializing in escape. She had learned to flee, to hide, to stand still, to control her scent, to conceal herself in waters. By humility she had survived her enemy, who had slain her own husband, and now she carried the children of the latter inside her, the last of the victorious race. They would be born in a few years. H. Sapiens had come meanwhile. He also had suffered from the terror of the kangaroo. In order to protect himself from its rapine, he had developed a subclass called H. Sapiens Armatus, a class which was concealed in metal scales and carried a lance, by means of which it defended itself against the Dinosauria. This subclass had perfected an order called H. Sapiens Armatus Georgius Sanctus, which was sufficiently unobserved to classify all the dinosaurs together as its enemies. Atlantosaurus thrust out her neck and thought with triumph of her unborn children. She had never killed in her life, and these, the future, would perpetuate a vegetarian race. She heard the clank of H. Sapiens Armatus Georgius Sanctus and turned the comely reptile head towards him in her kindly curiosity. Go on, said the wart. He killed her, of course concluded the serpent with sudden brevity turning its own head away. She was a reptile of my race. I am sorry said the wart. I don't know what to say. There is nothing, dear said the patient serpent, that you can say. Perhaps I had better tell you a legend or dream to change the subject. The wart said, 
I don't think I want to hear it, if it is sad. There is nothing sad said the other, except history. All these things are only something to muse upon while you are hibernating. It is a good thing to muse? Well, it passes the time. Even H. Sapiens has museums, you know. And as far as that goes, he has put the chalky bones of Atlantosaurus in many of them, along with the scales of Georgius Sanctus. If you knew a fairly cheerful legend said the wart, I think I could bear to hear that. Ridiculous Newt said T. Natrix affectionately for Newt seemed to be one of his pet words. I suppose I shall have to tell you a legend of my dangerous cousins for whom I suffer. Is it cheerful? Well, it just goes on to the end, you know, and then stops as legends do. Tell it said the wart. This legend said the snake in its sing-song voice, after a preparatory cough, comes from Burma, a place of which you have probably never heard. Once upon a time there was only one poisonous serpent in the world and this was the python. As you know, he is no longer venomous and the story of how he lost his venom is an interesting one. In those days he was perfectly white. He happened to make the acquaintance of the wife of a human being whose name was Aunt Wu, and in course of time they fell in love with each other. Aunt Wu left her husband and went off to live with the python, whose name was P. Reticulatus. She was in some ways an old-fashioned kind of person, the kind which delights in making carpet slippers for curates among the humans, and she soon set about weaving a most handsome and closely woven skin for her python. It was an ornamental affair, what with black lozenges and yellow dots, and here and there at regular intervals cubes and cross stitches of amber, such as the humans use in rug making or working samplers. P. Reticulatus was pleased with it, and wears it always, so that now he is not white anymore. At this time the python was interested in making experiments with his unique venom. Since he was the only poisonous snake, he naturally contained within himself all the poison which is nowadays spread out among the snakes. So concentrated was this terrible poison, therefore, that he could kill a man, however far away he was, simply by biting any footprint which the man had happened to leave on the ground. P. Reticulatus was naturally proud of this accomplishment, but he could never get ocular proof of it. He could not be there to see the man die, and at the same time three or four miles away to bite his footprint. Yet he wanted very much to establish the truth of the experiment. One day he decided that he would have to rely on evidence. He persuaded a crow that was a friend of his to go off to a village of the Karens, this was the name of the men in that district, and to watch and see if the man did die while he was biting the footprint. Now the Karens had a curious habit of celebrating a death or funeral, not by tears and lamentations, but by laughing, singing, dancing, jumping and beating on drums. When the crow arrived to watch events from a tree, and after the man had died, the Karens began to perform their usual rites in front of the hut in which he lay stricken. So the crow, after looking on for some time, returned to the python and reported that, so far from slaying by the venom of his bite, it had only the effect of causing extreme joy to human beings and of transporting them into the seventh heaven. The python was so furious that he climbed up to the very top of a tree and sicked up every ounce of his useless poison. Of course the python had to fall on something. Although the python had lost his power to sting, the tree itself became venomous, and its juice is used to this day by the anthropophagi to poison their arrows, while several creatures which happened to be underneath it received a due share. The cobra, the water snake and the frog were among them. Now Aunt U naturally had a soft spot for her fellow mortals and, when it was discovered that the poison was venomous after all, she upbraided P. Reticulatus for spreading the power to slay among so many beings. P. Reticulatus, who was grateful for his woven coat, felt remorse for what he had done and hurried off to see how he could improve matters. He explained the nature of the poison to all the creatures which had received it, 
and asked them to promise that their use of it should not be tyrannical. The cobra agreed to the remarks of the python and said, if there be transgression, so as to dazzle my eyes to make my tears fall seven times in one day, I will bite, but only then. So said most of the kindlier creatures. But the water snake and the silly frog said that they did not see what all this had to do with the python, and that they intended, for their part to bite whenever they felt like it. The python immediately set upon them, chased them into the water, and there, of course, the poison was dissolved and washed away. The wart waited to see if there was any more of the story, but there was not. The voice of T-Matrix had been getting slower and sleepier towards the end of it, for the afternoon was advancing, and the wind was beginning to fall cold. The sing-song had seemed to get more and more wrapped up in its subject, if you can follow the idea, until it seemed that the story was telling itself, while the serpent only drowsed though it was not possible to tell whether he was really asleep, because snakes have no eyelids to close. Thank you said the wart, I think that was a good story. Dream about it whispered T-Matrix sleepily while you hibernate. I will. Good night said the snake. Good night. The funny thing was that the wart really did feel sleepy, whether it was the voice of the snake, or the cold, or the influence of the story, in two minutes he was dreaming himself, in a reptilian drama, he was old, as old as the veins of the earth which were serpents like him, and Esculapius with a beard as white as glaciers was lulling him to sleep, he was teaching him wisdom, the ancient wisdom, by which the old snakes can walk with 300 feet at once upon the same world in which their grandchildren the birds have learnt to fly, he was singing to him the song of all the waters. In the great sea the stars swing over, the eternal whirlpool flows, rest, rest, wild head in the old bosom, which neither feels nor knows, she only rocks us, cradled in heaven, the reptile and the rose, her waters which bore us will receive us. Good night and sweet repose. In the end it took Merlin twenty shouts, in his high human voice, to wake the sleeping serpent up in time for tea. Chapter 14 In the autumn everybody was preparing for the winter. At night they spent most of the time rescuing daddy long legs from their candles and rushlights. In the daytime the cows were turned into the high stubble and weeds which have been left by the harvest sickles, while the pigs were driven into the purlieus of the forest, where boys beat the trees to supply them with acorns. Everybody was at a different job. From the granary there proceeded an invariable thumping of flails, in the strip fields, the slow and enormously heavy wooden plows sailed up and down all day for the rye and the wheat, while the sowers swung rhythmically along, with their hoffers round their necks, casting right hand for left foot and vice versa. Foraging parties came lumbering in with their spike-wheeled carts full of bracken, remarking wisely that they must get home with e breeks ear all summer be gone for tethered up cattle to sit down upon while others dragged in timber for the castle fires. The forest rang in the sharp air with the sound of beetle and wedge. Everybody was happy. The villains were slaves if you chose to look at it in one way, but if you chose to look at it in another, they were just the same farm laborers as starve on 30 shillings a week today. Only neither the villain nor the farm laborer did starve. It has never been an economic proposition for an owner of cattle to starve his cows, so why should an owner of slaves starve them? The truth is that nowadays the farm laborer is ready to accept so little money, because he does not have to throw his soul in with the bargain, as he would have to do in a town, and just the same freedom of spirit as obtained in the country since Sir Ector. The villains were laborers, they lived in the same one-roomed hut with their families, few chickens, litter of pigs, or cow possibly called Crumbeck. Most dreadful and insanitary, but they liked it, they were healthy, quite free of an air with no factory smoke in it, and, which was most of all, 
Their heart's interest was bound up with their skill and labor. They knew that Sir Ector loved and was proud of them. They were more valuable to him than even his cattle and, as he valued his cattle more than anything else except his children, this was saying a good deal. He walked and worked among them, thought of their welfare, and could tell the good workmen from the bad. He was the eternal farmer, in fact, one of those people who seemed to be employing labor at 30 shillings a week, but is actually paying half as much again in voluntary overtime, providing a cottage free or at nominal rent, and possibly making an extra present of his milk and eggs and home-brewed beer. Sir Ector now moved through all these activities with a brow of thunder. When an old lady who was sitting in a hedge on one of the strips of wheat, in order to scare away the rooks and pigeons, suddenly rose up beside him with an unearthly screech, he jumped a foot in the air. He was in a nervous state. Dang it said Sir Ector. Then, considering the subject more attentively, he added in a loud, indignant voice, Hell's bells and buckets of blood. He took the letter out of his pocket and read it again. The overlord of the castle of Forest Savage was not only a farmer, he was a military captain, of course, who was prepared to organize and lead the defense of his estate, and he was a sportsman who occasionally took a day's jousting when he could spare the time, but he was more than these. Sir Ector was an MFH or rather a master of stag and other hounds, and he hunted his own pack himself. Clumsy, Trounier, Phoebe Call, Gerland, Talbot, Lua, Lufra, Apollon, Orthros, Bran, Jellert, Bounce, Boy, Lion, Ungi, Toby, Diamond and Cavill were not pet dogs. They were the forest savage hounds, no subscription, two days a week, Huntsman the Master. This is what the letter said, if we translate it out of Latin. The king to Sir Ector, etc. We send you William Twitty, our huntsman, and his fellows to hunt in the forest savage with our boar hounds Conibus nostris porcarisis, in order that they may capture two or three boars. You are to cause the flesh they capture to be salted and kept in good condition, but the skins you are to cause to be bleached which they give you, as the said William shall tell you, and we command you to provide necessaries for them as long as they shall be with you by our command and the cost, etc., shall be accounted, etc. Witnessed at the Tower of London, 20 November, in the twelfth year of our reign, Uther Pendragon, 12 Uther, now the forest belonged to the king, and he had every right to send his hounds to hunt in it. Also he maintained a large number of hungry mouths, what with his court and his army, so that it was natural that he would want as many dead boars, bucks, rows, etc., to be salted down as possible. He was perfectly in the right, all this did not take away from the fact that Sir Ector regarded the forest as his forest, however, and resented the intrusion of the royal hounds as if his own would not do just as well, the king had only to send for a couple of boars, and he would have been only too glad to supply them himself. He feared that his coverts would be disturbed by a lot of wild royal retainers, never know what these city chaps will be up to next, and that the king's huntsman, this fellow Twitty, would sneer at his humble hunting establishment, unsettle the hunt servants, and perhaps even try to interfere with his own kennel management. In fact, Sir Ector was shy. Then there was another thing. Where the devil were the royal hounds to be kept, was he, Sir Ector, to turn his own hounds into the street, in order to put the king's hounds in his kennels. Hell's bells and buckets of blood, repeated the unhappy master. It was as bad as paying tithes. Sir Ector put the accursed letter in his pocket and stumped off up the plowing. The villains, seeing him go, remarked cheerfully, Our wold meester be on the gat again seemingly. It was a confounded piece of tyranny, that's what it was. It happened every year, but it still was that. He always solved the kennel problem in the same way. 
but it's still worried in. He would have to invite his neighbors to the meet specially, so as to look as impressive as possible under the royal huntsman's eyes, and this would mean sending messengers through the forest to Sir Grumnor, etc. Then he would have to show sport. The king had written early, so that evidently he intended to send the fellow at the very beginning of the season. The season did not begin till the 25th of December. Probably the chap would insist on one of those damned Boxing Day meets, all show off and no business, with hundreds of foot people all hollering and heading the boar, and tramping down the seeds and spoiling sport generally. How the devil was one to know in November where the best boars would be on Boxing Day? What with Sounders and Gore Jones and Hog Steers, you never knew where you were. And another thing, a hound that was going to be used next summer for the proper heart hunting was always entered at Christmas to the boar. It was the very beginning of its education, which led up through hairs and what nots to its real quarry, and this meant that the fellow Twitty would be bringing down a lot of raw puppies, which would be nothing but a plague to everybody. Dang it, said Sir Ector, and stamped upon a piece of mud. He stood gloomily for a moment, watching his two boys trying to catch the last leaves in the chase. They had not gone out with that intention, and did not really even in those distant days, believe that every leaf you caught, would mean a happy month next year. Only as the west wind tore the golden rags away, they looked extremely fascinating and were difficult to catch. For the mere sport of catching them, of shouting and laughing and feeling giddy as they looked up, and of darting about to trap the creatures which were certainly alive in the cunning with which they slipped away, the two boys were prancing about like young fawns in the ruin of the year. The only chap reflected Sir Ector, who could really be useful in show when the king's huntsman proper sport was that fellow Robin Hood. Robin Hood, they seem to be calling him now, some newfangled idea, no doubt, but Wooder Hood, he was the chap to know where a fine tush was to be found, been feasting on the creatures for months now. He wouldn't be surprised, even if they were out of season. But you couldn't very well ask a fellow to hunt up a few beasts of venery for you and then not invite him to the meet. While, if you did invite him to the meet, what would the king's huntsman and the neighbors say at having an outlaw for a fellow guest? Not that this Robin Wood wasn't a good fellow, he was a damn good fellow, and a good neighbor too. He had often tipped Sir Ector the wink when a raiding party was on its way from the marches, and never molested him or his farming in any way. What did it matter if he did chase himself a bit of venison now and then? There was 40 square miles of this forest, they said, and enough for all. Leave well alone, that was Sir Ector's motto. But that didn't alter the neighbors. Another thing was the riot. It was all very well for these crack hunts in practically artificial forests like those at Windsor, where the king hunted but it was quite a different thing in the forest savage. Suppose his majesty's famous hounds was to go run and riot after a unicorn or something? Everybody knew that you could never catch a unicorn without a young virgin for bait, in which case the unicorn meekly laid its white head and mother of pearl horn in her lap. And so the puppies would go charging off into the forest for leagues and leagues and never catch it and get lost, and then what would Sir Ector say to his sovereign? It wasn't only unicorns. There was this beast Gladyson that everybody had heard so much about. If you had the head of a serpent, the body of a leopard, the haunches of a lion, and were footed like a heart, and especially if you made a noise like thirty couples of hounds custom, it stood to reason that you would account for an excessive number of royal puppies before they pulled you down. Serve them right too. And what would King Pelliner say if Master William Twitty did succeed in killing his beast? Then there were the small dragons which lived under stones and hissed like kettles, dangerous varmints very. Or suppose they were to come across one of the really big dragons? The boy ward had been talking for months about nothing except some dragon called Atlantic something or other, which was killed by a chap called St. Georgius. Suppose they was to run into one of them? 
Why, the boy said it was a hundred and fifteen feet long. Sir Ector considered the prospect moodily for some time, then began to feel better. It would be a jolly good thing, he concluded, if Master Twitty and his beastly dogs did meet Atlantic what you may call it. Yes, and get eaten up by it too, everyone. Cheered by this vision, he turned round at the edge of the ploughing and stumped off home, at the hedge where the old lady lay waiting to scare rooks. He was lucky enough to spot some approaching pigeons before she was aware of him or them and let out such a screech that he felt amply repaid for his own jump by seeing hers. It was going to be a good evening after all. Good night to you said Sir Ector affably when the old lady recovered herself enough to drop him a curtsy. He felt so much restored by this that he dropped in on the vicar halfway up the village street and invited him to dinner in the hall. Then he climbed up to the solar which was his special chamber and sat down heavily to write a submissive message to King Uther in the two or three hours which remained to him before the meal. It would take him quite that time, what with sharpening quill pens, using too much sand to blot with going to the top of the stairs to ask the butler how to spell things, and starting again if he made a mess. Sir Ector sat in the solar, while the wintering sunlight threw broad orange beams across his bald head. He scratched and cluttered away and laboriously bit the end of his pen and the enormous castle room darkened about him. It was a room as big as the main hall over which it stood, and it could afford to have large southern windows because it was on the second story. There were two fireplaces in which the ashy logs of wood turned from grey to red as the sunlight retreated. Round these, some favourite hounds lay snuffling in their dreams, or scratching themselves for fleas, or gnawing mutton bones which they had scrounged from the kitchens. The peregrine falcon stood hooded on the perch in the corner, a motionless idle dreaming of other skies. If you were to go now to view the solar of Castle Savage, you would find it empty of furniture. But the sun would still stream in at those stone windows two feet thick, and, as it barred the mullions, it would catch the warmth of sandstone from them. The amber light of age. If you went to the nearest curiosity shop, you might find some clever copies of the furniture which it was supposed to contain. These would be oak chests and cupboards with gothic paneling and strange faces of men or angels or devils carved darkly upon them black bees waxed, worm-eaten and shiny, gloomy testimonies of the old life in their coffin-like solidity. But the furniture in the solar was not like that. The devil's heads were there and the linen fold paneling, but the wood was five or six centuries younger. So, in the warm-looking light of sunset, it was not only the millions which had an amber glow, all the spare, strong chests in the room, they were converted for sitting by laying bright carpets upon them, were the young, the golden oak, and the cheeks of the devils and cherubim shone, as if they had just been given a good soaping. Chapter 15 it was Christmas night, the eve of the Boxing Day meet. You must remember that this was in the old Merry England, when the rosy barons ate with their fingers, and had peacocks served before them, with all their tail feathers streaming, or boars' heads with the tusks stuck in again, when there was no unemployment, because there were too few people to be unemployed. When the forests ran with knights walloping each other on the helm, and the unicorns in the wintry moonlights damped with their silver feet and snorted their noble breaths of blue upon the frozen air. These marvels were great and comfortable ones, but in the old England there was a greater still. The weather behaved itself. In the spring all the little flowers came out obediently in the meads and the dew sparkled and the birds sang. In the summer, it was beautifully hot for no less than four months, and, if it did rain just enough for agricultural purposes, they managed to arrange it so that it rained while you were in bed. In the autumn the leaves flamed and rattled before the west winds, tempering their sad adieu with glory, and in the winter, which was confined by statute to two months, the snow lay evenly three feet thick, 
but never turned into slush. It was Christmas night in the castle of the forest Savage, and all around the castle the snow lay as it ought to lie. It hung heavily on the battlements, like extremely thick icing on a very good cake, and in a few convenient places, it modestly turned itself into the clearest icicles of the greatest possible length. It hung on the boughs of the forest trees in rounded lumps even better than apple blossom and occasionally slid off the roofs of the village when it saw a chance of falling upon some amusing character and giving pleasure to all. The boys made snowballs with it but never put stones in them to hurt each other, and the dogs, when they were taken out to scumber, bit it and told in it, and looked surprised but delighted when they vanished into the bigger drifts. There was skating on the moat, which roared all day with the gliding steel, while hot chestnuts and spiced mead were served on the bank to all and sundry. The owls hooted, the cooks put out all the crumbs they could for the small birds. The villagers brought out their red mufflers, Sir Ector's face shone redder even than these. And reddest of all shone the cottage fires all down the main street of an evening, while the winds howled outside and the old English wolves wandered about slavering in an appropriate manner, or sometimes peeping in at the keyholes with their blood-red eyes. It was Christmas night and all the proper things had been done. The whole village had come to dinner in the hall. There had been boar's head and venison and pork and beef and mutton and capons, but no turkey, on account of this bird not having yet been invented. There had been plum pudding and snapdragon, with blue fire on the tips of one's fingers, and as much meat as anybody could drink. Sir Ector's health had been drunk with best respects, meester or with best compliments of the season, my lords and ladies, and many of them. There had been mummers to play the exciting dramatic presentation of a story in which St. George and a Saracen and a very funny doctor did some surprising things, also carol singers who rendered a deist fidels and I sing of a maiden in high, clear tenor voices. After that, those children who had not been sick over their dinner played hoodman blind and other appropriate games, while the young men and maidens danced Morris dances in the middle, the tables having been cleared away. The old folks sat round the walls holding glasses of mead in their hands and feeling thankful that they were past all such capers, hoppings and skippings, while those children who had been sick sat with them and soon went to sleep, the small heads leaning against their shoulders. At the high table Sir Ector sat with his knightly guests, who had come for the morrow's hunting, smiling and nodding and drinking burgundy or sherry's sacramalmsy wine. After a bit, silence was prayed for Sir Grummore. He stood up and sang his old school song, amidst great applause, but forgot most of it, and had to make a humming noise in his mustache. The King Pelliner was nudged to his feet and sang bashfully. Oh, A was born a Pelliner in famous Lincolnshire. Full well A chas the questing beast for more than seventeen year, till A took up with Sir Grummore here. In the season of the year, since when tis my delight, on a featherbed night, to sleep at home, my dear, you see explained King Pelliner blushing, as he sat down with everybody whacking him on the back, old Grumnor invited me home, what after we had been having a splendid joust together, and since then I have been letting my beastly beast go and hang itself on the wall. What? Well done they all told him. You live your own life while you've got it. William Twitty was called for, who had arrived on the previous evening, and the famous huntsman stood up with a perfectly straight face, and his crooked eye fixed upon Sir Ector to sing. Do you ken William Twitty? With his jerkin so dat? Do you ken William Twitty? Who never yet lagged? Yes, I ken William Twitty. And he ought to be gagged with his hounds and his horn in the morning. Bravo, cried Sir Ector. Did you hear that, eh? Said he ought to be gagged, my dear fella. Blessed if I didn't think he was going to boast when he began. Splendid chaps these huntsmen, eh? Pass Master Twitty the Malmsey with my compliments. The boys lay curled under the benches near the fire, 
Wart with Cavill in his arms. Cavill did not like the heat and the shouting and the smell of mead and wanted to go away, but Wart held him tightly because he needed something to hug and Cavill had to stay with him perforce, panting over a long pink tongue. Now, Ralph Pasalu cried Sir Ector, and all his villains cried Ralph Pasalu. Good old Ralph, who killed the cow Ralph? Pray silence for Master Pasalu that couldn't help it. At this the most lovely old man got up at the very furthest and humblest end of the hall, as he had got up on all similar occasions for the past half century. He was no less than 87 years of age, almost blind, almost dumb, almost deaf, but still able and willing and happy to quaver out the same old song, which he had sung for the pleasure of the forest savage, since before Sir Ector was bound up in a kind of a tight linen putty in his cradle. They could not hear him at the high table he was much too far away in time to be able to reach across a room. But everybody knew what the cracked old voice was singing, and everybody loved it. This is what he sang. We and Wold King Cole was a whack in Dune Street. H.E. saw a lovely laid Y a step pin in a puddle. She lifted hupper skeet. Four two. Hop across her middle. And he saw her ankel. Wasn't that a fuddle? E. Cole turned out that E. Add to. There were about 20 verses of this song, in which Wold King Cole helplessly saw more and more things that he ought not to have seen, and everybody cheered at the end of each verse until, at the conclusion, old Ralph was overwhelmed with congratulations and sat down smiling dimly to a replenished mug of mead. It was now Sir Ector's turn to wind up the proceedings. He stood up importantly and delivered the following speech. Friends, tenants and otherwise, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, there was a faint cheer at this, for everybody recognized the speech which Sir Ector had made for the last twenty years and welcomed it like a brother. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, it is my pleasant duty I might say my very pleasant duty to welcome all and sundry to this our homely feast. It has been a good year, and I say it without fear of contradiction, in pasture and plough. We all know how Crumbuck of Forest Savage won the first prize at Cardwell Cattle Show for the second time, and one more year will win the cup outright. More power to the Forest Savage. As we sit down tonight, I notice some faces now gone from amongst us and some which have added to the family circle. Such matters are in the hands of an almighty providence, to which we all feel thankful. We ourselves have been first created and then spared to enjoy the rejoicings of this pleasant evening. I think we are all grateful for the blessings which have been showered upon us. Tonight we welcome in our midst the famous King Pelliner, whose labors in ridden our forest of the redoubtable quest and beast are known to us all. God bless King Pelliner. Here, here. Also Sir Grummore Grummersome, a sportsman, though I say it to his face, who will stick to his mount as long as his quest will stand up in front of him. Hooray. Finally, last but not least, we are honored by a visit from His Majesty's most famous huntsman, Master William Twitty, who will, I feel sure, show us such sport tomorrow that we will rub our eyes and wish that a royal pack of hounds could always be hunting in the forest which we all love so well. View how Wu and several recheats blown in imitation. Thank you, my dear friends, for your spontaneous welcome to these gentlemen. They will, I know, accept it in the true and warm-hearted spirit in which it is offered. And now it is time that I should bring my brief remarks to a close. Another year has almost sped, and it is time that we should be looking forward to the challenge in future. What about the cattle show next year? Friends, I can only wish you a very Merry Christmas and, after Reverend Sidebottom has said our grace for us, we shall conclude with a singing of the National Anthem. The cheers which broke out at the end of Sir Ector's speech were only just prevented by several hushes from drowning the last part of the vicar's grace in Latin, and then everybody stood up loyally in the firelight and sang. God save King Pendragon, may his reign long drag on, God save the king.
send him most glorious, great and uproarious, horrible and horrious, God save our king. The last notes died away, the hall emptied of its rejoicing humanity. Lanterns flickered outside in the village street as everybody went home in bands for fear of the moonlit wolves and the castle of the forest savage slept peacefully and lightless in the strange silence of the holy snow. Chapter 16. The ward got up very early the next morning. He made a determined effort the moment he woke up, threw off the great bearskin rug under which he slept, and plunged his body into the biting air. He dressed furiously, trembling, skipping about to keep warm, and hissing blue breaths to himself, as if he were grooming a horse. He broke the ice in a basin and dipped his face in it with a grimace, like eating something sour, said Aya, and rubbed his stinging cheeks vigorously with a towel. Then he felt quite warm again, and scampered off to the emergency kennels to watch the king's huntsman making his last arrangements. Master William Twitty turned out in daylight to be a shriveled, harassed-looking man, with an expression of deep melancholy on his face. All his life he had been forced to pursue various animals for the royal table and, when he had caught them, to cut them up into the various joints. He was more than half a butcher. He had to know what parts the hounds should eat and what parts should be given to his various assistants. He had to cut everything up handsomely, leaving two vertebrae on the tail to make the chine look attractive, and almost ever since he could remember he had been either pursuing a heart or cutting it up into joints. He was not particularly fond of doing this. The hearts and the hinds in their herds, the boars in their singulars, the skulks of foxes, the richesses of martins, the bevies of rose, the seats of badgers and the routs of wolves, all came to him more or less as something which you either skinned or flayed, and then took home to the cook. You could talk to him about os and argus, suet and grease, crotes, fumets and fiance, but he only looked polite. He knew that you were showing off your knowledge of these words which were to him a business. You could talk about a mighty boar which had nearly slashed you last winter, but he only stared at you with his distant eyes. He had been slashed sixteen times by mighty boars, and his legs had white wheels of shiny flesh that stretched right up to his ribs. While you talked, he got on with whatever part of his profession he had in hand. There was only one thing which could move Master William Twitty. Summer or winter, snow or shine, he was running or galloping after boars and hearts, and all the time his soul was somewhere else. Mention a hare to Master Twitty, and, although he would still go on galloping after the wretched heart which seemed to be his destiny, he would gallop with one eye over his shoulder, yearning for puss. It was the only thing he ever talked about. He was always being sent to one castle or another, all over England, and when he was there the local servants would have eaten and keep his glass filled and ask him about his greatest hunts. He would answer distractedly in monosyllables. But if anybody mentioned a husk of hairs he was all attention, and then he would thump his glass upon the table and discourse upon the marvels of this astonishing beast declaring that you could never blow a meanie for it, because the same hair could at one time be male and another time female, while it carried grease and crowded and gnawed, which things no beast in the earth did accept it. Wart watched the great man in silence for some time, then went indoors to see if there was any hope of breakfast. He found that there was, for the whole castle was suffering from the same sort of nervous excitement which had got him out of bed so early, and even Merlin had dressed himself in a pair of running shorts to see the fun. Boar hunting was fun, it was nothing like badger digging or covert shooting or fox hunting today. Perhaps the nearest thing to it would be ferreting for rabbits, except that you use dogs instead of ferrets, 
had a boar that quite easily might kill you, instead of a rabbit, and carried a boar spear upon which your life depended instead of a gun. They did not usually hunt the boar on horseback. Perhaps the reason for this was that the boar season happened in the two winter months when the old English snow would be liable to ball in your horse's hoofs and render galloping too dangerous. The result was that you were yourself on foot, armed only with steel, against an adversary who weighed a good deal more than you did and who could unseam you from the nave to the chaps and set your head upon his battlements. There was only one rule in boar hunting, it was, hold on, if the boar charged you, you had to drop on one knee and present your boar spear in his direction. You held the butt of it with your right hand on the ground to take the shock, while you stretched your left arm to its fullest extent and held the spear tightly with it, as high up as possible. You kept the point towards the charging boar. The spear was as sharp as a razor, and it had a cross piece about 18 inches away from the point. This cross piece or horizontal bar prevented the spear from going more than 18 inches into his chest. Without the cross piece, a charging boar would have been capable of rushing right up the spear, even if it did go through him, and getting at you like that. But with the cross piece he was held away from you at a spear's length, with 18 inches of steel inside him. It was in this situation that you had to hold on. He weighed between 10 and 20 score and his one object in life was to heave and weave and sidestep until he could get at you and champ you into chops, while your one object was not to let go of the spear clasped tight under your arm until somebody had come to finish him off. If only you could keep hold of your end of the spear while the other end was stuck in him, you knew that there was at least a spear's length between you, however much he ran you round the forest. You may be able to understand, if you think this over, why all the sportsmen of the castle got up early for the Boxing Day meet and ate their breakfast with a certain amount of suppressed feeling. I said Sir Grumnor, gnawing a pork chop which he held in his fingers down in time for breakfast, hey, yes, I am said the wart. Fine hunting mornin' said Sir Grumnor, got your spear sharp, hey, yes, I have, thank you said the wart. He went over to the sideboard to get a chop for himself. Come on, Helenor said Sir Ector. Have a few of these chickens, you're eating nothing this morning. King Pelliner said, A don't think A will, thank you all the same. A don't think A feel quite the thing this morning. What? Sir Grumor took his nose out of his chop and inquired sharply, Nerves? Oh, no, cried King Pelliner. Oh, no, really not that. What? A think A must have taken something last night that disagreed with me. Nonsense, my dear fella said Sir Ector, here, you just have a few chickens to keep your strength up. He helped the unfortunate king to two or three capons and the latter sat down miserably at the end of the table trying to swallow down a few bits of them. Neat them said Sir Grumor meaningly, by the end of the day, I dare say. Do you think so? asked King Pelliner anxiously. No so said Sir Grumnor, and winked at his host. The wart, however, noticed that both Sir Ector and Sir Grumnor were eating with rather exaggerated gusto. He did not himself feel that he could manage more than one chop, and, as for Kay, he had stayed away from the breakfast room altogether. When breakfast was over, and Master Twitty had been consulted, the Boxing Day cavalcade moved off to the meet. Perhaps the hounds would have seemed rather a mixed pack to the master of the corn today. There were half a dozen black and white allants, which looked like greyhounds with the heads of bull terriers or worse. These, which were the proper hounds for boars, wore muzzles on account of their ferocity. The gaze hounds of which there were two taken just in case, were in reality nothing but greyhounds according to modern language, while the limers were a sort of mixture between the bloodhound and the red setter of today. The latter had collars on and were led with straps. The brachets were just like beagles and trotted along with the master in the way that beagles always have trotted and a charming way it is. 
With the hounds went the foot people, Merlin, in his running shorts, looked rather like Lord Baden-Powell, only, of course, the latter has not got a beard. Sir Ector was dressed in sensible leather clothes it was not considered sporting to hunt in armor, and he walked beside Master Twitty with that bothered and important expression, which has always been worn by masters of hounds. Sir Grunmore, just behind, was puffing rather and asking everybody whether they had sharpened their spears. King Pelliner had dropped back right among the villagers feeling that there was safety in numbers. And all the villagers were there, every male soul on the estate from Hob the Ostranger down to Old Watt with no nose, all carrying spears or pitchforks or old scythe blades or stout poles. Even some of the young women who were courting had come out with baskets of provisions for their men. It was a regular boxing day meet. At the edge of the forest the last follower joined up. He was a tall and distinguished looking person dressed in green, and he carried a seven-foot bow. Good morning, master, he said pleasantly to Sir Ector. Ah, yes, said Sir Ector. Yes, yes, good morning, eh, yes, good morning. Then he led the gentleman in green aside and said in a loud whisper, that could be heard by everybody, for heaven's sake, my dear fellow, do be careful. This is the king's own huntsman, and those two other chaps are King Pelliner and Sir Grunmore. Now do be a good chap, my dear fellow, and don't say anything controversial, will you, old boy, there's a good chap? Certainly I won't said the green man reassuringly, but I think you had better introduce me to them. Sir Ector blushed deeply and called out, Ah, Grunmore, come over here a minute, will you? I want to introduce a friend of mine, old chap, a chap called Wood, old chap Wood with a W, you know, not an H, yes, and this is King Pelliner. Master Wood King Pelliner. Hale said King Pelliner, who had not quite got out of the habit when nervous. How do said Sir Grunmore? No relation to Robin Hood, I suppose. Oh, not in the least interrupted Sir Ector hastily. W, double O, D, you know, like the stuff they make furniture out of furniture. You know, and spears, and well spears, you know, and furniture. How do you do said Robin? Hale said King Pelliner. Well said Sir Grunmore, it's funny you should both wear green. Yes, it is funny, isn't it? said Sir Ector anxiously. He wears it in mourning for an aunt of his, who died by falling out of a tree. Beg pardon, I'm sure said Sir Grumore, grieved at having touched upon this tender subject, and all was well. Now, then, Mr. Wood said Sir Ector when he had recovered himself. Where shall we go for our first draw? As soon as this question had been put, Master Twitty was fetched into the conversation, and a brief confabulation followed, in which all sorts of technical terms like lesses were bandied about. Then there was a long walk in the wintry forest, and the fun began. Ward had lost the rather panically feeling which had taken hold of his stomach when he was breaking his fast. The exercise and the snow wind had breathed him, so that his eyes sparkled almost as brilliantly as the frost crystals in the white winter sunlight, and his blood raced with the excitement of the chase. He watched the limer who held the two bloodhound dogs on their leashes, and saw the dogs straining more and more, as the boar's lair was approached. He saw how, one by one and ending with the gaze hounds who did not hunt by scent, the various hounds became uneasy and began to whimper with desire. He noticed Robin pause and pick up some lesses, which he handed to Master Twitty, and then the whole cavalcade came to a halt. They had reached the dangerous spot. Boar hunting was like cub hunting to this extent that the boar was attempted to be held up. The object of the hunt was to kill him as quickly as possible. Ward took up his position in the circle round the monster's lair and knelt down on one knee in the snow with the handle of his spear couched on the ground ready for emergencies. He felt the hush which fell upon the company and saw Master Twitty wave silently to the limer to uncouple his hounds. The two limers plunged immediately into the covert which the hunters surrounded. They ran mute. 
There were five long minutes during which nothing happened, the hearts beat thunderously in the circle, and a small vein on the side of each neck throbbed in harmony with each heart. The heads turned quickly from side to side as each man assured himself of his neighbors, and the breath of life steamed away on the north wind most sweetly as each realized how beautiful life was, which a reeking tusk might, in a few seconds, rape away from one or another of them if things went wrong. The boar did not this time express his fury with his voice. There was no uproar in the covert or yelping from the limers. Only, about a hundred yards away from the wart, there was suddenly a black creature standing on the edge of the clearing. It did not seem to be a boar particularly, not in the first seconds that it stood there. It had come too quickly to appear to be anything. It was charging Sir Grummore before the ward had recognized what it was. The black thing rushed over the white snow, throwing up little puffs of it. Sir Grummore, also looking black against the snow, turned a quick somersault in a rather large puff. A kind of grunt, but no noise of falling came clearly on the north wind, and then the boar was gone. When it was gone, but not before, the wart knew certain things about it, things which he had not had time to notice while the boar was there. He remembered the rank mane of bristles standing upright on its razor back, one flash of a sour tush, the staring ribs, the head held low, and a red flame from a piggy eye. Sir Grummore got up, dusting snow out of himself unhurt, blaming his spear. A few drops of blood were to be seen frothing on the white earth. Master Twitty put his horn to his lips. The allants were uncoupled as the exciting notes of the Mimi began to ring through the forest, and then the whole scene began to move. The limers which had reared the boar the proper word for dislodging were allowed to pursue him to make them keen on their work. The brashes gave musical tongue. The allants galloped baying through the drifts. Everybody began to shout and run. Avoy, avoy, cried the foot people. Shahu, shahu. Avant, sire, avant. Swef, swef, cried Master Twitty anxiously. Now, now, gentlemen, get the hounds room if you please. A say, a say, cried King Pelliner. Did anybody see which way he went? What an exciting day. What? Sa sa sai avant, sa sai avant, sa sai avant. Hold heart, Pelliner, cried Sir Ector. Where hounds, where hounds, can't catch him yourself, you know. Il est halt ti il est halt, and till est ho echoed the foot people. Tilly Ho sang the trees. Tally Ho murmured the distant snowdrifts as the heavy branches disturbed by the vibrations slid noiseless puffs of sparkling powder onto the muffled earth. The wart found himself running with Master Twitty. It was like beagling in a way, except that it was beagling in a forest where it was sometimes difficult even to move. Everything depended on the music of the hounds and the various notes which the huntsman could blow to tell where he was and what he was doing. Without these the whole field would have been lost in two minutes, and even with them about half of it was lost in three. Wart stuck to Twitty like a burr. He could move as quickly as the huntsman because, although the latter possessed the experience of a lifetime, he himself was smaller to get through obstacles, and had moreover been taught by Maid Marian. He noticed that Robin kept up too, but soon the grunting of Sir Ector and the buying of King Pelliner was left behind. Sir Grummore had given in early, having had most of the breath knocked out of him by the boar, and stood far in the rear, declaring that his spear could no longer be quite sharp. Kay had stayed with him, so that he should not get lost. The foot people had been early mislaid, because they did not understand the notes of the horn. Merlin had torn his shorts and stopped to try and mend them again by magic. The sergeant had thrown out his chest so far in crying tally-ho, and telling everybody which way they ought to run, that he had soon lost all sense of place, and was leading a disconsolate party of villagers in Indian file, at the double, with knees up, in the wrong direction. 
Hob was still in the running. Swef Swef panted the huntsman again, addressing the wart, as if he had been a hound. Not so fast, master. They are going off the line. Even as he spoke, Wart noticed that the hound music was weaker and more querulous. Stop said Robin, or we may tumble over him. The music died away. Swef, swef, shouted Master Twitty at the top of his voice. Stow a rear, so how, so how. He swung his baldric in front of him, and, lifting the horn to his lips, began to blow a recheat. There was a single note from one of the limers. Who a rear cried the huntsman. The limer's note grew in confidence, faltered, then rose the full bay. Who a rear, hear, how, Amy, hark to Beaumont the valiant, ho moy, ho moy, ho, 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 ho. The limer was taken up by the tenor bells of the branches. The noise grew to a crescendo of excitement as the bloodthirsty thunder of the alons pealed through the lesser notes. They have him said Twitty briefly, and the three humans began to run again, while the huntsman blew encouragement with true Roo Root. In a small bushment the grimly boar stood at bay. He had got his hind quarters into the nook of a tree blown down by a gale, in an impregnable position. He stood on the defensive with his upper jaw writhed back in a snarl. The blood of Sir Grumnor's gash welled fatly among the bristles of his shoulder and down his leg, while the foam of his chops dropped on the blushing snow and melted it. His small eyes darted in every direction. The hounds stood round, yelling at his hateful mask, and Beaumont, with his back broken, writhed at his feet. He paid no further attention to the living hound, for it could do no harm. He was black, flaming and bloody. So Ho said the huntsman softly. He advanced upon the murderer with his spear held out in front of him, and the hounds encouraged by their master, stepped forward with him pace by pace. The scene changed as suddenly as a house of cards falling down. The boar was not at bay anymore, but charging Master Twitty. As it charged the alons closed in, seizing it fiercely by shoulder or throat or leg, so that what surged down on the huntsman was not one boar but a bundle of animals. He dared not use his spear for fear of hurting the dogs. The bundle rolled forward remorselessly, as if the hounds did not impede it at all. Twitty began to reverse his spear to keep the charge off with its butt end, but even as he reversed it, the tussle was upon him. He sprang back, tripped over a root, and the battle closed on top. The wart pranced round the edge, waving his own spear in an agony, but there was nowhere he dared to thrust it in. Robin dropped his spear, drew his falchion in the same movement, stepped into the huddle of snarls, and calmly picked an alon up by the leg. The dog did not let go, but there was space where its body had been. Into this space the falchion went slowly, once, twice, thrice. The whole superstructure stumbled, recovered itself, stumbled again, and sank down ponderously on its left side. The hunt was over. Master William Twitty drew one leg slowly from under the boar, stood up took hold of his knee with his right hand moved it inquiringly in various directions, nodded to himself and stretched his back straight. Then he picked up his spear without saying anything and limped over towards Beaumont. He knelt down beside him and took his head on his lap. He stroked Beaumont's head and said, Hark to Beaumont. Softly, Beaumont, mon ami. Oi is a Beaumont the valiant, Swef, le douce Beaumont, Swef, Swef. Beaumont licked his hand, but could not wag his tail. The huntsman nodded to Robin, who was standing behind and held the hound's eyes with his own. He said, Good dog, Beaumont the valiant. Sleep now, old friend Beaumont, good old dog. Then Robin's falchion let Beaumont out of this world to run free with Orion and to roll among the stars. The wart did not like to watch Master Twitty for a moment or two. The strange, little leathery man stood up without saying anything and whipped the hounds off the corpse of the boar as he was accustomed to do. He put his horn to his lips and blew the four long notes of the mort without a quaver. But he was blowing the notes for something else, and he startled the wart because he seemed to be crying. 
The mort brought most of the stragglers up in due time. Hob was there already and Sir Ector came up next, whacking the brambles aside with his boar spear, puffing importantly and shouting, well done, Twitty. Splendid hunt, very. That's the way to chase a beast of venery, I will say. What does he weigh? The others dribbled in by batches, King Pelliner bounding along and crying out, tally ho. Tally ho, tally ho. In ignorance that the hunt was done, when informed of this fact, he stopped and said tally ho. What? In a feeble voice, then relapsed into silence. Even the sergeant's Indian file arrived in the end, still doubling with knees up and were halted in the clearing while the sergeant explained to them with great satisfaction that if it had not been for him, all would have been lost. Merlin appeared, holding up his running shorts, having failed in his magic. Sir Grumore came stumping along with Kay, saying that it had been one of the finest points he had ever seen run, although he had not seen it, and then the butcher's business of the undoing was proceeded with a pace. Over this there was a bit of excitement, King Pelliner, who had really been scarcely himself all day, made the fatal mistake of asking when the hounds were going to be given their quarry. Now, as everybody knows, a quarry is a reward of entrails, etc., which is given to the hounds on the height of the dead beast, Sir Lequer, and, as everybody else knows, a slain boar is not skinned. It is disembowelled without the hide being taken off, and, since there can be no hide, there can be no quarry. We all know that the hounds are rewarded with a foul ale, a mixture of bowels and bread cooked over a fire, and, of course, poor King Pelliner had used the wrong word. So King Pelliner's trousers were taken down amid loud husses, and the protesting monarch was bent over the dead beast, and given a hearty smack with a sword blade by Sir Ector. King Pelliner then said, I do think you are all a lot of beastly cads, and wandered off mumbling into the forest. The boar was undone, the hounds rewarded and the foot people standing about in chattering groups because they would have got wet if they had sat down in the snow, ate the provisions which the young women had brought in baskets, a small barrel of wine which had been thoughtfully provided by Sir Ector was broached and a good drink was had by all. The boar's feet were tied together, a pole was slipped between its legs, and two men hoisted it upon their shoulders. William Twitty stood back and courteously blew the prize. It was at this moment that King Pelliner reappeared. Even before he came into view they could hear him crashing in the undergrowth and calling out, Ace, Ace, come here at once. A most dreadful thing has happened. He appeared dramatically upon the edge of the clearing just as a disturbed branch whose burden was too heavy emptied a couple of hundred weight of snow upon his head. King Pelliner paid no attention. He climbed out of the snow heap as if he had not noticed it, still calling out a say. A say. What is it, Pelliner? shouted Sir Ector. Oh, come quick, cried the king, and turning round distracted, he vanished again into the forest. Is he all right? inquired Sir Ector. Do you suppose? Excitable character said Sir Grumore. Very. Better follow up and see what he's doing. The procession moved off sedately in King Pelliner's direction, following his erratic course by the fresh tracks in the snow. The spectacle which they came across was one for which they were not prepared. In the middle of a dead gorse bush King Pelliner was sitting, with tears streaming down his face. In his lap there was an enormous snake's head which he was patting. At the other end of the snake's head there was a long, lean, yellow body with spots on it. At the end of the body there were some lion's legs which ended in the slots of a heart. There, there King Pelliner was saying, A didn't mean to leave you all together. It was only because A wanted to sleep in a feather bed just for a bit. A was coming back, honestly A was. Oh, please don't die, beast, and leave me without any fumix. When he saw Sir Ector, the king took command of the situation. Desperation had given him authority. Now, then, Ector he exclaimed, don't stand there like a ninny, fetch that barrel of wine along at once. 
They brought the barrel and poured out a generous tot for the questing beast. Poor creature said King Pelliner indignantly. It's pined away, positively pined away, just because there was nobody to take an interest in it. How A could have stayed all that well with Sir Grummore and never given my old beast a thought A really don't know. Look at its ribs, A ask you, like the hoops of a barrel, and lying out in the snow all by itself almost without the will to live. Come on, beast, you see if you can't get down another gulp of this. It will do you good. Mo locking about in a feather bed added the remorseful monarch glaring at Sir Grumnor, like a like a kidney. But how did you how did you find it? Faltered Sir Grumnor. A happened on it, and small thanks to you, running about like a lot of nincompoops and smacking each other with swords. A happened on it in this gorse bush here, with snow all over its poor back and tears in its eyes, and nobody to care for it in the wide world. It's what comes of not leading a regular life. Before, it was alright. We got up at the same time, and quested for regular hours, and went to bed at half past ten. Now look at it. It's gone to pieces altogether, and it will be your fault if it dies, you and your hummocky bed. But Pelliner said Sir Grumore. Shut your mouth replied the king at once. Don't stand there bleeding like a fool, man. Do something. Fetch another pole so that we can carry old Gladys at home. Now, then Hector, haven't you got any sense? We must just carry him home and put him in front of the kitchen fire. Send somebody on to make some bread and milk. And you, Twitty, or whatever you choose to call yourself, stop fiddling with that trumpet of yours and run ahead to get some blankets warmed. When we get home concluded King Pelliner, the first thing will be to give it a nourishing meal, and then, if it's all right in the morning, A'll give it a couple of hours start, and then hey ho for the old life once again. What about that, Gladyson? Hey, you'll tack the high road and A'll tack the low road, but, come along, Robin Hood, or whoever you are you may think A don't know, but A do stop leaning on your bow with that look of negligent woodcraft. Pull yourself together, man, and get that muscle-bound sergeant to help you carry her. Now then, lift her easy. Come along, you chuckle heads, and mind you don't trip. Feather beds and quarry, indeed, a lot of childish nonsense. Go on, advance, proceed, step forward, march. Feather brains, a call it. That's what a do. And as for you, Grummore added the king, even after he had concluded, you can just roll yourself up in your feather bed and stifle in it. Chapter 17 I think it is time, said Merlin looking at him over the top of his spectacles one afternoon, that you had another dose of education. That is, as time goes, it was an afternoon in early spring, and everything outside the window looked most beautiful. The winter mantle had gone, taking with it Sir Grumore, Master Twitty King Pelliner and the questing beast, the latter having revived under the influence of kindliness and bread and milk. It had bounded off into the snow with every sign of gratitude to be followed two hours later by the excited king, and the watchers from the battlements had observed it confusing its snowy footprints most ingeniously, as it reached the edge of the chase it was running backwards, bounding twenty foot sideways, rubbing out its marks with its tail climbing along horizontal branches, and performing many other tricks with evident enjoyment. They had also seen King Pelliner, who had dutifully kept his eyes shut and counted ten thousand while this was going on, becoming quite confused when he arrived at the difficult spot and finally galloping off in the wrong direction, with his brashy trailing behind him. It was a lovely afternoon. Outside the schoolroom window, 
The larches of the distant forest had already assumed the fullness of their dazzling green, the earth twinkled and swelled with a million drops, and every bird in the world had come home to court and sing. The village folk were forth in their gardens every evening, planting garden beans, and it seemed that, what with these emergencies and those of the slugs, coincidentally with the beans, the buds, the lambs, and the birds, every living thing had conspired to come out. What would you like to be? asked Merlin. Wart looked out of the window, listening to the thrush's twice done song of dew. He said, I have been a bird once, but it was only in the muse at night, and I never got a chance to fly. Even if one ought not to do one's education twice, don't you think I could be a bird so as to learn about that? He had been bitten with the craze for birds which bites all sensible people in the spring, and which sometimes even leads to such excesses as birds nesting, etc. I can see no reason why you shouldn't said the magician. Why not try it at night? But they will all be asleep at night, all the better chance of inspecting them without their flying away. You could go with Archimedes this evening, and he would tell you about them. Would you do that Archimedes? I should love to said the owl. I was feeling like a little saunter myself. Do you know asked the wart thinking of the thrush, why birds sing, or how? Is it a language? Of course it's a language. It isn't a big language like human speech, but it's large. Gilbert White said Merlin, remarks, or will remark, however you like to put it, that the language of birds is very ancient, and, like other ancient modes of speech, little is said, but much is intended. He also says somewhere that the rooks, in the breeding season, attempt sometimes, in the gaiety of their hearts, to sing, but with no great success. I love rooks, said the wart. It's funny, but I think they are my favorite bird. Why? asked Archimedes. Well, I like them, I like their sauce. Neglectful parents quoted Merlin, who was in a scholarly mood, and saucy, perverse children. It is true, said Archimedes reflectively, that all the corvidy possess a distorted sense of humor. Ward explained, I love the way they enjoy flying. They don't just fly, like other birds, but they fly for fun. It is lovely when they hoist home to bed in a flock at night, all cheering and making rude remarks, and pouncing on each other in a vulgar way. They turn over on their backs sometimes and tumble out of the air, just to be ridiculous, or else because they have forgotten they are flying, and have coarsely begun to scratch themselves for fleas, without thinking about it. They are intelligent birds, said Archimedes, in spite of their humor. They are one of the birds that have parliaments, you know, and a social system. Do you mean that they have laws? Certainly they have laws. They meet in the autumn, in a field, to talk them over. What sort of laws? Oh, well, laws about the defense of the rookery, and marriage, and so forth. You are not allowed to marry outside the rookery, and, if you do become quite lost to all sense of decency, and bring back a sable virgin from a neighboring settlement, then everybody pulls your nest to pieces as fast as you can build it up. They make you go into the suburbs, you know, and that is why every rookery has outlying nests all round it, several trees away. Another thing I like about them said the wart is their go. They may be thieves and practical jokers, and they do quarrel and bully each other in a squawky way, but they have got the courage to mob their enemies. I should think it takes some courage to mob a hawk even if there is a pack of you, and even while they are doing it they clown. They are mobs set Archimedes loftily. You have said the word, well, they are larky mobs, anyway said the wart, and I like them. What is your favorite bird? asked Merlin politely, to keep the peace. Archimedes thought this over for some time, and then said, well, it's a large question, you know, it's rather like asking you what is your favorite book. On the whole, however, I think that I must prefer the pigeon, to eat. 
I was leaving that side of it out, said the owl in civilized tones. Actually the pigeon is the favorite dish of all raptors, if they are big enough to take her, but I was thinking of nothing but domestic habits. Describe them. The pigeon said Archimedes is a kind of Quaker, she dresses in grey, a dutiful child, a constant lover, and a wise parent, she knows like all philosophers, that the hand of every man is against her, she has learned throughout the centuries to specialize in escape, no pigeon has ever committed an act of aggression nor turned upon her persecutors, but no bird, likewise, is so skillful in eluding them. She has learned to drop out of a tree on the opposite side to man and to fly, so that there is a hedge between them. No other bird can estimate a range so well. Vigilant, powdery, odorous and loose-feathered, so that dogs object to take them in their mouths, armored against pellets by the closeness of these feathers, the pigeons coo to one another with true love, nourish their cunningly hidden children with true solicitude, and flee from the aggressor with true philosophy. A race of peace lovers continually caravaning away from the destructive Indian in covered wagons, they are loving individualists surviving against the forces of massacre only by wisdom and escape. Did you know added Archimedes that a pair of pigeons always roosts head to tail, so that they can keep a lookout in both directions? I know our tame pigeons do said the wart, what I like about wood pigeons is the clap of their wings, and how they soar up and close their wings and sink during their courting flights, so that they fly rather like woodpeckers. It isn't very like woodpeckers said Merlin. No, it isn't admitted the wart. And what is your favorite bird? asked Archimedes feeling that his master ought to be allowed to say. Merlin put his fingers together like Sherlock Holmes and replied immediately, I prefer the chaffinch. My friend Linnaeus calls him Coelebs or Bachelor Bird. The flocks have the sense to separate during the winter, so that all the males are in one flock and all the females in the other. For the winter months at any rate, there is perfect peace. The conversation observed Archimedes arose out of whether birds could talk. Another friend of mine said Merlin immediately in his most learned voice maintains or will maintain that the questions of the language of birds arises out of imitation. Aristotle, you know, also attributes tragedy to imitation. Archimedes sighed heavily and remarked in prophetic tones, you had better get it off your chest. It's like this said Merlin, the kestrel drops upon a mouse, and the poor mouse, transfixed with those needle talons, cries out in agony, his one squeal of kee. Next time the kestrel sees a mouse, his own soul cries out key in imitation. Another kestrel perhaps his mate comes to that cry, and after a few million years all the kestrels are calling each other, with their individual notes of ki ki ki. You can't make the whole story out of one bird, said the wart. I don't want to. The hawks scream like their prey, the mallards croak like the frogs they eat, the shrikes also, like those creatures in distress, the blackbirds and thrushes click like the snail shells they hammer to pieces, the various finches make the noise of cracking seeds, and the woodpecker imitates the tapping on wood, which he makes to get the insects that he eats. But all birds do not give a single note. No, of course not. The call note arises out of imitation, and then the various bird songs are developed by repeating the single call note and descanting upon it. I see said Archimedes coldly. And what about me? Well, you know quite well said Merlin, that the shrew mouse you pounce upon squeals out quick. That is why the young of your species call kiwik. And the old? inquired Archimedes sarcastically. Haru, Haru cried Merlin, refusing to be damped. It's obvious, my dear fellow, after their first winter. That's the wind in the hollow trees where they prefer to sleep. I see said Archimedes more coolly than ever. This time, we note, it is not a question of prey at all. 
Oh, come along, replied Merlin. There are other things besides the things you eat. Even a bird drinks sometimes, for instance, or bathes itself in water. It is the liquid notes of a river that we hear in a robin's song. It seems now, said Archimedes, that it is no longer a question of what we eat, but also of what we drink or hear. And why not? The owl said resignedly, oh, well. I think it is an interesting idea said the wart to encourage his tutor. But how does a language come out of these imitations? They repeat them at first said Merlin, and then they vary them. You don't seem to realize what a lot of meaning there resides in the tone and the speed of voice. Suppose I were to say what a nice day just like that. You would answer, yes, so it is. But if I were to say, what a nice day in caressing tones. You might think I was a nice person. But then again, if I were to say, what a nice day quite breathless. You might look about you to see what had put me in a fright. It is like this that the birds have developed their language. Would you mind telling us, said Archimedes, since you know so much about it, how many various things we birds are able to express by altering the tempo and emphasis of the elaborations of our call notes? But a large number of things. You can cry kiwik in tender accents if you are in love, or kiwik angrily in challenger in hate. You can cry it on a rising scale as a call note if you don't know where your partner is, or to attract their attention away if strangers are straying near your nest. If you go near the old nest in the winter time, you may cry kiwik lovingly a conditioned reflex from the pleasures which you once enjoyed within it. And if I come near to you in a startling way, you may cry out kiwik 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 in loud alarm. When we come to conditioned reflexes remarked Archimedes sourly, I prefer to look for a mouse. So you may. And when you find it, I dare say you will make another sound characteristic of owls, though not often mentioned in books of ornithology. I refer to the sound talker TCK which human beings call a smacking of the lips. And what sound is that supposed to imitate? Obviously, the breaking of mousy bones. You are a cunning master, said Archimedes admiringly, and as far as a poor owl is concerned, you will just have to get away with it. All I can tell you from my own personal experience is that it is not like that at all. A tick can tell you not only that it is in danger, but what kind of danger it is in. It can say, look out for the cat or look out for the hawk or look out for the tawny owl as plainly as ABC. I don't deny it said Merlin, I am only telling you the beginnings of language. Suppose you try to tell me the song of any single bird which I can't attribute originally to imitation? The night jar said the wart. The buzzing of the wings of beetles replied his tutor at once. The nightingale cried Archimedes desperately. Ah said Merlin, leaning back in his comfortable chair. Now we are to imitate the soul song of our beloved Proserpine, as she stirs to wake in all her liquid self. Taru said the wart softly. Hugh added the owl quietly. Music, concluded the necromancer in ecstasy, quite unable to make the smallest beginnings of an imitation. Hallo said Kay, opening the door of the afternoon schoolroom. I'm sorry I'm late for the geography lesson. I was trying to get a few small birds with my crossbow. Look, I have killed a thrush. Chapter 18 the wart lay awake as he had been instructed to do. He was to wait until Kay was asleep, and then Archimedes would come for him with Merlin's magic. He lay under the great bearskin and stared out of the window at the stars of spring, no longer frosty and metallic, but as if they had been new washed and had swollen with the moisture. It was a lovely evening, without rain or cloud. The sky between the stars was of the deepest and the fullest velvet. Framed in the thick western window, Aldebaran and Beetlejuice were racing serious over the horizon. The hunting dog star looked to his master Orion, who had only just heaved himself above the rim. 
In at the window came also the unfolding scent of benighted flowers for the currants, the wild cherries, the plums and the hawthorn were already in bloom and no less than five nightingales were holding a contest of beauty among the bowery, the looming trees. Wart lay on his back with his bare skin half off him and his hands clasped behind his head. It was too beautiful to sleep too temperate for the rug. He watched out at the stars in a kind of trance. Soon it would be the summer again when he could sleep on the battlements and watch these stars hovering as close as moths above his face and in the milky way at least with something of the moldy pollen. They would be at the same time so distant that unutterable thoughts of space and eternity would baffle themselves in his sighing breast, and he would imagine to himself how he was falling upwards higher and higher amongst them, never reaching, never ending, leaving and losing everything in the tranquil speed of space. He was fast asleep when Archimedes came for him. Eat this, said Archimedes, and handed him a dead mouse. The wart felt so strange that he took the furry atomy without protest and popped it into his mouth without any feelings that it was going to be horrid. So he was not surprised when it turned out to be excellent, with a fruity taste like eating a peach with the skin on. Though naturally the skin was not so nice as the mouse. Now, we had better fly, said the owl. Just flip to the window sill here. To get accustomed to yourself before we take off, Wart jumped for the sill and automatically gave himself an extra kick with his wings, just as a high jumper swings his arms. He landed on the sill with rather a thump as owls are apt to do, did not stop himself in time and toppled straight out of the window. This he thought to himself cheerfully is where I break my neck. It was curious, but he was not taking life at all seriously. He felt the castle walls streaking past him and the ground in the moat swimming up. He kicked with his wings and the ground sank again, like water in a leaking well. In a second that kick of his wings had lost its effect and the ground was welling up again. He kicked again. It was extraordinarily queer, going forward like this with the earth ebbing and flowing beneath him, in the utter silence of his down-fringed feathers. For heaven's sake panted Archimedes, bobbing up and down in the dark air beside him, do stop flying like a woodpecker. Anybody would take you for a little owl if the brutes had been invented. What you are doing is to give yourself flying speed with one flick of your wings. You then rise on that flick until you have lost flying speed and begin to stall. Then you give another just as you are beginning to drop out of the air and do a switchback. It's extremely confusing to keep up with you. Well said the wart recklessly, if I stop doing this, I shall just go bump altogether. Idiot said the owl, waver your wings all the time, like me, instead of doing these solitary bounds. The wart did what he was told and was surprised to find that the ridiculous earth became stable again and moved underneath him without tilting in a regular pour. He did not feel himself to be moving at all. That's better. How curious everything looks observed the wart with some wonder now that he had time to look about him. And indeed, the world did look curious. In some ways the best description of it would be to say that it looked a little like a photographer's negative, for he was seeing one ray beyond the spectrum which is visible to human beings. An infrared camera will take photographs in the dark when we cannot see, and it will also take photographs in daylight. The owls are the same, for it is quite untrue that they can only see at night. They see in the day just as well, only they happen to possess the advantage of seeing pretty well at night also, and so they naturally prefer to do their hunting then, when other creatures are more at their mercy. To the wart the green trees would have looked whitish in the daytime, as if they were covered with apple blossom, and now, at night, everything had the same kind of different look. It was like flying in a twilight which had reduced everything to shades of the same color, and, as in the twilight, there was a considerable amount of gloom. Do you like it? asked the owl. 
I like it very much. Do you know, when I was a fish there were parts of the water which were colder or warmer than other parts, and now it is the same in the air. The temperature of both said Archimedes instructively, depends upon the vegetation at the bottom. Woods or weeds, they make it warm above them. Well said the wart, I can see why the reptiles who had given up being fishes, decided to become birds. It certainly is fun. You are beginning to fit things together remarked Archimedes. Do you mind if we sit down? How does one, you must stall. That means you must launch yourself upwards until you lose flying speed, and then, just as you feel yourself beginning to tumble why, you sit down. Haven't you noticed how birds usually fly upwards to perch? They don't come straight down on the branch, but dive below it and then rise. At the top of their rise they stall and sit down. But birds land on the ground too. And what about mallards on the water? They can't rise to sit on that. Well, it's perfectly possible to land on flat things, but more difficult. You have to glide in at stalling speed all the way, and then increase your wind resistance by cupping your wings, dropping your feet, tail, etc. You may have noticed that few birds do it really gracefully. Look how a crow thumps down and how the mallard splashes. The spoon-winged birds like heron and plover seem to do it best. As a matter of fact, we owls aren't so bad at it ourselves. And the long-winged birds like swifts, I suppose they are the worst for they can't rise from a flat surface at all. The reasons are different said Archimedes, yet the fact is true. But need we talk on the wing? I am getting quite tired. So am I. Owls usually prefer to sit down every few hundred yards. The wart copied Archimedes in zooming up towards the branch which they had selected. He began to fall just as they were above it, clutched it with his furry feet at the last moment, swayed backwards and forwards twice, and found that he had landed successfully. He folded up his wings. While the wart was still admiring the view, his friend proceeded to give him a longish lecture upon flight and birds. He told how, although the swift was so fine a flyer that he could sleep on the wing all night, and although the wart himself had claimed to admire the way in which rooks enjoyed their flights, the real aeronaut of the lower strata, which cut out the swift, was the plover. He explained how plovers indulged in aerobatics, and would actually do such stunts as spins, stall turns and even rolls for the mere grace of the thing. They were the only birds which made a practice of slipping off height to land. Ward paid little or no attention to the lecture, but got his eyes accustomed to the strange tones of light instead, and watched Archimedes out of the corner of one of them. For Archimedes, while he was talking, was absent-mindedly spying for his dinner. This spying was an odd performance. You know how a spinning top which is beginning to lose its spin, slowly describes circles with its highest point before falling down. The leg of the top remains in the same place, but the apex makes circles which get bigger and bigger towards the end. This is what Archimedes was absent-mindedly doing. His feet remained stationary, but he moved the upper part of his body round and round, like somebody trying to see from behind a fat lady at a cinema, and uncertain which side of her gave the best view, as he could also turn his head almost completely round on his shoulders, you may imagine that his antics were worth watching. What are you doing? asked the wart. But even as he asked, Archimedes was gone. First there had been an owl talking about plover, and then there was no owl. Only, far below the wart, there was a thump and a rattle of leaves, as the aerial torpedo went smack into the middle of a bush quite regardless of obstructions. In a minute the owl was sitting beside him again on the branch, thoughtfully breaking up a dead sparrow. May I do that? asked the wart, inclined to be bloodthirsty. As a matter of fact said Archimedes, after waiting to crop his mouthful, you may not. That magic mouse which turned you into an owl will be quite enough for you after all. You've been eating as a human all day, and no owl kills for pleasure. It simply isn't done. 
Besides, I am supposed to be taking you for your education, and as soon as I have finished my snack here, that is what we shall have to do. Where are you going to take me? Archimedes finished his sparrow, wiped his beak politely on the bow, and turned his tender eyes full upon the wart. These great, round eyes had, as a famous writer has expressed it, a bloom of light upon them, like the purple bloom of powder on a grape. I am going to take you said he slowly, where no human being has ever been, to see my dear mother Athene, the goddess of wisdom. It was a long and terrible journey passing beyond the midnight country of sorrow, and the sun-drained wastes of solitude, into the undiscovered country of Kanaku Hair, whose latitude is 91 degrees north and longitude 181 degrees west. Here, in the luminous hollow of a tree stump that had been blasted by lightning and whittled clean by the winds of knowledge, they alighted on the outstretched hands of the goddess. Athene was invisible, or at least the wart never remembered having seen her afterwards. At the time he did not notice that she was invisible, it only struck him when he woke up next morning because he was aware of her without seeing her. He was aware that her unthinkable beauty was neither that of age nor of youth, that her eyes were the only things you thought of looking at, and that to be her was terrible, whereas to be with her was the only joy. If you can understand this, she was in herself so unhappy that words only melt in such temperatures, but towards other people, she was the spirit of invincible mercy and protection. She lived, of course, beyond sorrow and solitude, and, if you follow me, the suffering which had brought her there had left her with a kind of supernatural good manners. She was the conqueror. Archimedes kissed her tenderly. He was not overawed by her, but saluted her almost with pity, as if he were a man of the world visiting his sister, a nun who did not understand how to get on in his world, or perhaps a prosperous banker who had always tried to be reasonably decent meeting the man whose destiny it was to be nailed up and left to die of sunstroke, agony and exhaustion. In order to save the prosperous bankers, even Archimedes did not understand her. She knew this. Hail, mother said Archimedes. I have brought you a young human who is to learn things by decree. When the wart came to think about it afterwards, he realized that he had not only never seen the goddess, but that he had also never heard her speak. The owl spoke and he spoke, but the words of Athene did not come out of a mouth. This part set Archimedes with a sort of purr, is at the rate of 30 years in a minute. It is one of our owl's dreams, you know, such as we gain our wisdom from in the sighing of the night. Athene did not speak, but she held the ward in the hollow of her kind hand, and he knew that he was to look in front of him. He saw the world with his own eyes now, no longer using the strange spectrum which he had experienced since he came out with Archimedes, and no doubt this was done in order to make things easier for him. They needed to be made easier, for it was now his business to watch a world in which a year passed in two seconds. It was a world of trees. We dream of this explained Archimedes when we perch on a tree in the winds of winter, or sleep in its hollow in the rains of spring. Sometimes nowadays you can see a cinema film of a flower, for instance, in which one exposure has been taken every hour. In it you see the petals expand and throb open or shut for day or night until the whole story is over and the seeds have been thrown out upon the wind. There was a woodland now in front of the ward, and in it an oak sapling which grew, flourished and shed its leaves into nakedness, all in the time during which you could slowly count three. A whole year had passed in that time, with all its human joys and sorrows. This said Athene, or at any rate it is what she seemed to be saying, in the most glorious of voices, is called the dream of the trees. People don't think of trees as alive, we never see them moving unless the wind disturbs them, and then it is not their movement but the winds. The wart saw now that trees are living, and do move, he saw all the forest, like seaweed on the ocean's floor, how the branches rose and groped about and waved, 
how they panted forth their leaves like breathing, and indeed they were breathing, and, what is still more extraordinary, how they talked. If you should be at a cinema when the talking apparatus breaks down, you may have the experience of hearing it start again too slowly, then you will hear the words which would be real words at a proper speed, now droning out unintelligibly in long roars and sighs which give no meaning to the human brain. The same thing happens with a gramophone whose disc is not revolving fast. So it is with humans, we cannot hear the trees talking, except as a vague noise of roaring and hushing which we attribute to the wind in the leaves, because they talk too slowly for us. These noises are really the syllables and vowels of the trees. You may speak for yourself, said Athene. Oak spoke first, as became the noblest of all. He stood throbbing his leaves in the twilight to which time had mixed down day and night, stretching out his great muscular branches, yawning, as if it were, like a noble giant of the earth who cracks his limbs in the morning when he wakes. As said the oak, it's good to be alive, look at my biceps, will you? Do you see how the other trees are afraid of gravity, afraid that he will break their branches off? They point them up in the air, or down at the ground, so as to give the old earth giant his least purchase upon them. Now I am ready to challenge gravity, and I can stretch my branches straight out in a line parallel to the earth. He may swing on them for all I care, but bless you, they won't break. Do you know how long I live? A thousand years is my expectation. Three hundred years to grow, three hundred years to live, and three hundred years to die. And when I am dead, what of that? They make me into timber, into ships and house beams that will be good for another thousand. My leaves come the last and go the last. I am a conservative, I am, and out of my apples they make ink, whose words may live as long as me, even as me. The oak, Ash said softly, I am the Venus of the forest, I am pliable. My dear madam said a rather society box, in smirking, urban, scholastic 18th century accents, a decoction of box wood, promotes the growth of hair, while an oil distilled from its shavings is a cure for hemorrhoids, toothache, epilepsy, and stomach worms. So, at least, we are told. If it comes to being sarcastic replied a homely hazel, who was a good fellow at heart, although he was inclined to snap, may I mention that hazel chips will clear turbid wine in 24 hours, and twigs of hazel twisted together will serve for yeast and brewing? You may be a sort of Lord Chesterfield, but at least you will have to yield to me in the matter of genteel tipsyfication, practiced by the elegant gentlemen of your century. As far as drink goes said an impossibly female IV, who was always clinging to her husband, putting her oar in, and making his life a misery, ground ivy is used for clarifying beer. She simpered when she said the word beer in the most unpleasant way. She was a sour creature in any light. I don't know why we are talking about drinks at a dignified beach, but if we are talking about it, I may as well mention that Virgil's drinking bowl, Divini Opus Alcimedontis, was turned out of my wood. Great men remarked a close-grained spelt lime, are always going back to the trees. Grinling Gibbons would never carve his nets and baskets out of anything but me. And Salvador Rosa said a chestnut, was always painting me. Corrit said a willow, sighing, was fond of me. How your humans do spin about remarked a crafty elm coldly. What a speed they live at. It is rather good sport trying to spot them and then to drop an old bow on their heads if you get them directly underneath. But of course you have to stand very still and give no signs of dropping it till the actual moment. The cream of the joke is that they make the coffins out of me afterwards. You always were a treacherous fellow replied an old you. What's the point of it? Surely it's better to help than to hinder? Now Oak here, and a few others of us, we take pride in keeping faith. We like to be steadfast. Everybody prizes me because, like Alder, I scorn to rot in water. My gateposts are more durable than iron, for they do not even rust. 
yes chimed in some cypresses, sycamores and others. Live and let live, that's the best motto. We and our sisters are always pleased to see the grass growing under our shade. On the contrary, said a fur who always killed the grass beneath him, and a nervous aspen joined in. Kill or be killed, that's the way to get on. But please don't talk of killing added the aspen. The cross was made out of me, and I have trembled ever since. I only kill, you know, because I am frightened. It is a terrible thing always to be afraid. A cedar decided to cheer her up. Oh, come he remarked twinkling his dusky spines. What's the point of all this argument and boasting about your powers? It seems to me that you all take life too seriously. Look at my old friend Sequoia here, who has had the humorous idea of constructing himself a very hard-looking bark out of soft blotting paper, so that you can punch him without hurting yourself. If it comes to that, look at me. What is my mission in life? You may think it a humble one considering my size, but I find it amusing. I am antipathetic to fleas. All the trees laughed at this, it resulted in a splendid summer that year, and decided to go on with their dance. It was a sort of Indian dance, in which they moved their bodies but not their feet, and a very graceful one it was. The wart watched while the whole troop of them rippled their twigs like serpents, or made slow ritual gestures about their heads and bodies with the larger boughs. He saw how they grew big and lusty in their dancing, how they threw their arms out towards heaven in an ecstasy of being alive. The younger trees tired first. The little fruit trees stopped waving, hung their weary heads for a moment, then fell down on the ground. The big ones moved more slowly, faltered and fell one by one, till only Oak was left. He stood with his chin sunk upon his chest kept upright by his mighty will, thinking of the lovely dance which now was over. He sighed and looked upwards to Athene, stretched out his bare arms sorrowfully to her, to ask her why, and then he also fell on sleep. The next dream, said Athene, is called the dream of the stones. It is the last dream she will give you, added Archimedes, and this one goes at two million years a second. You will have to keep your eyes skinned. Wart saw a darkness in front of him, with lights in it. The dark was so dark that it was like lamp black, and the lights so light that the coldest blue fire of diamonds could not touch them. The harsh contrast between them made his eyes ache. He was looking at Sirius, actually, just as he had been looking at him a few hours before. But it took him quite a time before he realized that he was looking at a star at all. There was none of the mellow velvet which he had been accustomed to see through the Earth's atmosphere, but only this fierce emptiness of black and white, and beside this fact, the constellations were in different positions. It was a few thousand million years ago, and all the shapes of the evening have altered since then. The nearest star, which looked the biggest for that reason, burnt with a roar of terrible gases, and another star was coming towards it. You could see them surging on their endless paths into eternity, marking their aimed but aimless courses across the universe, with straight lines of remembered fire like the meteors, with which the Creator sometimes stitched together the weak seams of our dome, the bright darning needles, suddenly darted in and out of the velvet by a finger on the other side. As the two stars came closer together a huge mountain of flame was dragged out by attraction from each. When they were at their closest point the top of this mountain broke off from the smaller star and streamed through the emptiness towards the bigger. Some of it reached its destination, but the bigger star was proceeding quickly on its way, and some of it was left behind. This part hung in space, lost to both its parents and its seducer, a whirling cigar of fire. Its mists of flame began to crystallize as they cooled to turn into drops, as water does when it is cooled from steam. The drops took up a circular path of their own spinning round the star from which they had been dragged. The wart found himself closer to the third drop. Its haze of incandescent worms crawled in and out of it, formed into funnels and whirlpools, crept over its round surface, sometimes leapt out into space, crawled over, and rained back. 
They were flames. The light died down from far beyond white to blue to red to a dim brown. It became a ball of steam. Out of this steam a smaller ball shot out. The first ball shrank and was a globe of boiling water. The water began to cool, but the fires still burnt inside it. They convulsed the surface of the water, threw up great continents and islands of the interior rock. The centuries were passing so quickly that even these continents seemed to bubble like porridge, as the volcanoes and mountains and earthquakes came and went. The unbridled furnace within was still unstable, and, till quite late in the dream, the globe did not always spin on the same axis, but lurched over sideways as some stress gave way inside. The lurches destroyed continents and made more. The wart found himself closer still. He was actually on the globe and facing an enormous cliff. At two million years a second, the cliff's mountain moved. It was alive as the trees had been, and roared most dreadfully. It fell, it folded on itself, it shoved itself along the surface of the globe, pushing a bow wave of its own folds for miles. Its great rock split and powdered, pouring stone torrents into the heaving sea. The sea itself grew tired of the mountain, made it to sink down and to be covered. Another convulsion threw up the remains again, streaming. Round the foot of the chastened mountain, there lay its powder and its pebbles, great rocks worn smooth by the sea. The rocks themselves broke and were scattered, the sea always rolling and rolling them together between its hands until the tiny fragments were often as round as their mother had been, the globe. A green scum formed over the sinking mountain, a haze of color which was still sometimes dipped under the water or lifted high above it, as the earth undulated. The trees came, but their voices were quite drowned by the slower howling of the mineral world, which twitched through millennia like a dog's skin in sleep. Hold fast was what the rocks thundered. Hold, cohere. But all the time they were broken apart, thrown down, and their hold broken. There was nothing to be seen of the mountain except a flat green plain which had some pebbles on it. They were bits of the cliff which he had first watched. The dream, like the one before it lasted about half an hour. In the last three minutes of the dream some fishes, dragons and such like, ran hurriedly about. A dragon swallowed one of the pebbles, but spat it out. In the ultimate twinkling of an eye, far tinier in time than the last millimeter on a six-foot rule, there came a man. He split up the one pebble which remained of all that mountain with blows, then made an arrow head of it, and slew his brother. Well, Wart said Kay in an exasperated voice. Do you want all the rug, and why do you heave and mutter so, you were snoring too. I don't snore, replied the Wart indignantly. You do. I don't. You do. You snore like a volcano. I don't. You do. I don't. And you snore worse. No, I don't. Yes, you do. How can I snore worse if you don't snore at all? By the time they had thrashed this out, they were nearly late for breakfast. They dressed hurriedly and ran out into the spring. Chapter 19. In the evenings, except in the very height of summer, they used to meet in the solar after the last meal of the day. There the parson, Reverend Sidebottom, or if he were busy over his sermon then Merlin himself, would read to them out of some learned book of tales to calm their spirits. It was glorious in the winter, while the big logs roared in the fire, the beech blew flamey and relentless, the elm showy and soon gone, the holly bright, or the pine with his smoking scents, while the dogs dreamed of conquest, or the boys imagined those sweet maidens letting down their golden hair, so that their rescuers might save them out of towers. But almost at any time of the year it was as good. The book they usually used was just a romanorum, whose fascinating tales began with such provoking sentences as there was a certain king, who had a singular partiality for little dogs, that barked loudly or a certain nobleman had a white cow. 
to which he was extremely partial. He assigned two reasons for this first because she was spotlessly white and next because the boys and for that matter the men would sit as quiet as church mice while the marvels of the story were unfolded and when the unpredictable narrative had come to an end, they would look towards Reverend Sidebottom or Merlin who was not so good at it to have the story explained. Reverend Sidebottom would draw a deep breath and plunge into his task explaining how the certain king was really Christ and the barking dog zealous preachers, or how the white cow was the soul, and her milk represented prayer and supplication. Sometimes, indeed generally, the unfortunate vicar was hard put to it to find a moral, but nobody ever doubted that his explanations were the right ones, and anyway, most of his listeners were soon asleep. It was a fine summer night, the last night which would give any excuse for fires, and Reverend Sidebottom was reading out his tale. Wart lay snoozing among the lean ribs of the gaze hounds. Sir Ector sipped his wine with his eyes brooding on the logs which lit the evening. Kay played chess with himself rather badly, and Merlin, with his long beard saffron in the firelight, sat cross-legged knitting beside the wart. There was once discovered at Rome Red Reverend Sidebottom through his nose an uncorrupted body taller than the wall of the city, on which the following words were inscribed Paulus, the son of Evander, whom the lance of a crooked soldier slew, is interred here. A candle burnt at his head which neither water nor wind could extinguish, until air was admitted through a hole made with the point of a needle beneath the flame. The wound of which this giant had died was four and a half feet long. Having been killed after the overthrow of Troy, he remained in his tomb 2,240 years. Have you ever seen a giant? asked Merlin softly so as not to interrupt the reading. No, I remember you haven't, just catch hold of my hand a moment and shut your eyes. The vicar was droning on about the gigantic son of Evander, Sir Ector was staring into the fire, and Kay was making a slight click as he moved one of the chessmen, but the ward and Merlin were immediately standing hand in hand in an unknown forest. This is the forest of the burbly water said Merlin, and we are going to visit the giant Galapas. Now listen, you are invisible at the moment because you are holding my hand. I am able to keep myself invisible by an exercise of willpower, an exceedingly exhausting job it is, and I can keep you invisible so long as you hold on to me. It takes twice as much willpower, but there. If, however, you let go of me even for a moment, during that moment you will become visible, and, if you do it in the presence of Galapas, he will munch you up in two bites. So hold on. Very well said the wart. Don't say very well. It isn't very well at all. On the contrary, it is very ill indeed. And another thing, the whole of this beastly wood is dotted with pitfalls, and I shall be grateful if you will look where you are going. What sort of pitfalls? He digs a lot of pits about 10 feet deep with smooth clay walls and covers them over with dead branches, pine needles and such like. Then, if people walk about, they tumble into them, and he goes round with his bow every morning to finish them off. When he has shot them dead, he climbs in and collects them for dinner. He can hoist himself out of a ten-foot pit quite easily. Very well said the ward again, and corrected himself too, I will be careful. Being invisible is not so pleasant as it sounds. After a few minutes of it you forget where you last left your hands and legs, or at least you can only guess two within three or four inches, and the result is that it is by no means easy to make your way through a brambly wood. You can see the brambles all right, but where exactly you are in relation to them becomes more confusing. The only guide to your legs, for the feeling in them soon becomes complicated, is by looking for your footprints, these you can see in the neatly flattened grass below you, and as for your arms and hands, it becomes hopeless, unless you concentrate your mind to remember where you put them last. 
you can generally tell where your body is, either by the unnatural bend of a thorn branch, or by the pain of one of its thorns, or by the strange feeling of centralness which all human beings have, because we keep our souls in the region of our liver. Hold on said Merlin, and for glory's sake don't trip up. They proceeded to tread their tipsy way through the forest, staring carefully at the earth in front of them in case it should give way, and stopping very often when an extra-large bramble fastened itself in their flesh. When Merlin was stuck with a bramble, he swore, and when he swore he lost some of his concentration, and they both became dimly visible, like autumn mist. The rabbits upwind of them stood on their hind legs at this and exclaimed, Good gracious, what are we going to do? asked the wart. Well said Merlin, here we are at the burbly water, you can see the giant's castle on the opposite bank, and we shall have to swim across. It may be difficult to walk when you are invisible, but to swim is perfectly impossible, even with years of practice, you are always getting your nose underwater, so I shall have to let go of you until we have swum across in our own time. Don't forget to meet me quickly on the other side. The wart went down into the warm starlit water, which ran musically like a real salmon stream, and struck out for the other side. He swam fast across and down river, with a kind of natural dog stroke and he had to go about a quarter of a mile below his landing place along the bank before Merlin also came out to meet him, dripping. Merlin swam the breast stroke very slowly and with great precision, watching ahead of him over the bow wave of his beard with that faintly anxious expression of a faithful retriever. Now said Merlin, catch hold again, and we will see what Galapas is about. They walked invisible across the sward, where many unhappy-looking gardeners with iron collars round their necks were mowing, weeding and sweeping by torchlight, although it was so late, in what had begun to be a garden. They were slaves. Talk in whispers, said Merlin, if you have to talk. There was a brick wall in front of them, with fruit trees nailed along it, and this they were forced to climb. They did so by the usual methods of bending over climbing on each other's backs, giving a hand up from on top, and so forth. But every time that the wart was compelled to let go of his magician for a moment he became visible. It was like an early cinematograph flickering very badly, or one of those magic lanterns where you put in slide after slide. A slave gardener, looking at that part of the wall, sadly tapped himself on the head and went away into a shrubbery to be sick. Hush whispered Merlin from the top of the wall, and they looked down upon the giant in person, as he took his evening ease by candlelight upon the bowling green. But he's not big at all, whispered the wart disappointedly. He is ten feet high hissed Merlin, and that is extremely big for a giant. I chose the best one I knew. Even Goliath was only six cubits in a span or nine feet four inches. If you don't like him you can go home. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be ungrateful, Merlin, only I thought they were sixty feet long, and that sort of thing. Sixty feet sniffed the necromancer. The giant had heard something at the top of the wall, and looked up towards them, remarking in a rumbling tone, how the bats squeak at night. Then he poured himself out another hornful of Madeira, and tossed it off in one draft. Merlin lowered his voice and explained, People find the teeth and bones of creatures like your friend Atlantosaurus, and then they tell stories about human giants. One of them found a tooth weighing 200 ounces. It's dragons, not giants, that grow really big. But can't humans grow big too? I don't understand it myself. But it is something about the composition of their bones. If a human was to grow 60 feet high, he would simply snap his bones with the weight of their own gravity. The biggest real giant was Eliezer, and he was only 10 feet and a half. Well said the wart. I must say it is rather a disappointment. I don't mean being brought to see him he added hastily, but that they don't grow like I thought. Still, I suppose 10 feet is quite big when you come to think of it. 
It is twice as high as you are said Merlin, you would just come up to his navel, and he could pitch you up to a corn rick about as high as you can throw a sheaf. They had become interested in this discussion, so that they got less and less careful of their voices, and now the giant rose up out of his easy chair. He came towards them with a three-gallon bottle of wine in his hand and stared earnestly at the wall on which they were sitting. Then he threw the bottle at the wall rather to their left, said in an angry voice, beastly screech owls, and proceeded to stump off into the castle. Follow him cried Merlin quickly. They scrambled down off the wall, joined hands, and hurried after the giant by the garden door. In the beginning the downstairs parts were reasonably civilized with green baize doors behind which butlers and footmen though with iron collars round their necks were polishing silver and finishing off the decanters. Later on there were strong rooms with ancient safes in them that contained the various gold cups, aperns and other trophies won at jousts and horse races by the giant. Next there were dismal cellars with cobwebs over the wine bins and dreary looking rats peeping thoughtfully at the bodiless footprints in the dust and several corpses of human beings hanging up in the game cupboards until they should be ready to eat. It was like the place for adults only in the chamber of horrors at Madame Tussauds. At the very bottom of the castle they came upon the dungeons. Here the chalky walls dripped with greasy moisture, and there were pathetic messages and graffiti scratched upon the stone. Pray for poor Priscilla said one, and another said, Oh, if I had only paid for my dog license honestly, I should never have come to this pass. There was a picture of a man hanging from a gallows with arms and legs sticking out like those of a guy fox in all directions, and another of a demon with horns. A fifth carving said, Midnight Sun for the 2.30, while the sixth said, Oh, yeah? And a seventh exclaimed, Alas, that I should have forgotten to feed my poor canary. Now I am in the same dread doom. A message which had been scratched out said, Beastly old Galapas loves Madame Mim, the dirty hound, and somebody else had written, Repent and be saved, for the kingdom of hell is at hand. There were kisses, dates, pious ejaculations, mottos such as waste not, want not, and good night, ladies also hearts with arrows in them, skulls and crossbones, pictures of pigs drawn with the eyes shut, and pathetic messages such as, don't forget to take the potatoes off at half past twelve, the key is under the geranium, revenge me on stinking galapas by whom I am fully slain or merely Nazawiti need for night starvation. It was a grimly place. Ha! Huh, cried Galapas, stopping outside one of his cells. Are you going to give me back my patent unbreakable helm, or make me another one? It's not your helm answered a feeble voice. I invented it, and I patented it, and you can go sing for another one, you beast. No dinner tomorrow said Galapas cruelly, and went on to the next cell. What about that publicity? Asked the giant. Are you going to say that the Queen of Sheba made an unprovoked attack upon me, and that I took her country in self-defense? No. I'm not said the journalist in the cell. Rubber truncheons for you said Galapas in the morning. Where have you hidden my elastic stays? Thundered the giant at the third cell. I shan't tell you said the cell. If you don't tell me said Galapas, I shall have your feet burnt. You can do what you like. Oh, come on, pleaded the giant. My tummy hangs down without them. If you will tell me where you put them, I will make you a general, and you shall go hunting in Poland in a fur cap. Or you can have a pet lion, or a comic beard, and you can fly to America with an armada. Would you like to marry any of my daughters? I think all you propositions are foul, said the cell. You had better have a public trial of me for propaganda. You are just a mean, horrible bully, said the giant, and went on to the next cell. Now then, said Galapas, what about that ransom, you dirty English pig? Aim not a pig, said the cell, and aim not dirty, or a wasn't until I fell into that beastly pit. Now I've got pine needles all down my back. 
What have you done with my toothbrush, you giant, and where have you put my poor little brache? What? Never mind your brache and your toothbrush shouted Galapas, what about that ransom, you idiot, or are you too steeped in British sottishness to understand anything at all? I want to brush my teeth answered King Pelliner obstinately. They feel funny, if you understand what I mean, and it makes me feel not very well. Lol no bestial cried the giant, have you no finer feelings? No said King Pelliner. I don't think I have. I want to brush my teeth, and I am getting cramped through sitting all the time on this bench, or whatever you call it. Unbelievable sot screamed the master of the castle. Where is your soul, you shopkeeper? Do you think of nothing but your teeth? I think a lot of things, old boy said King Pelliner. I think of how nice it would be to have a poached egg, what? Well, you shan't have a poached egg, you shall just stay there until you pay my ransom. How do you suppose I am to run my business if I don't have my ransoms? What about my concentration camps? And my thousand dollar wreaths at funerals? Do you suppose that all this is run on nothing? Why, I had to send a wreath for King Quithno Garanher, which consisted of a Welsh harp 40 feet long, made entirely out of orchids. It said, Melodious angels sing thee to thy rest. I think that was a very good wreath, said King Pelliner admiringly. But couldn't they have my toothbrush? What? Dash it all? Really? It isn't much compared with a wreath like that, or is it? Imbecile exclaimed the giant and moved on to the next cell. We shall have to rescue him whispered the wart. It is poor old King Pelliner, and he must have fallen into one of those traps you were telling me about while he was after the questing beast. Let him stay said Merlin, a chap who doesn't know enough to keep himself out of the clutches of one of these giants isn't worth troubling about. Perhaps he was thinking about something else whispered the wart. Well, he shouldn't have been hissed the magician. Giants like this do absolutely no harm in the long run, and you can keep them quite quiet by the smallest considerations, such as giving them back their stays. Anybody knows that. If he has got himself into trouble with Galapas, let him stay in it. Let him pay the ransom. I know for a fact said the wart, that he hasn't got the money. He can't even afford to buy himself a feather bed. Then he should be polite said Merlin doubtfully. He is trying to be said the wart. He doesn't understand very much. Oh, please King Pelliner is a friend of mine, and I don't like to see him in these forbidding cells without a single helper. Whatever can we do? Cried Merlin angrily. The cells are firmly locked. There was really nothing to do, but the magician's louder cry had altered matters into a crisis. Forgetting to be silent as well as invisible, Merlin had spoken too loudly for the safety of his expedition. Who's there? shrieked Galapas, wheeling round at the fifth cell. It's nothing cried Merlin, only a mouse. The giant Galapas whipped out his mighty sword and stared backwards down the narrow passage with his torch held high above his head. Nonsense, he pronounced. Mouses don't talk in human speech. Eek said Merlin, hoping that this would do. You can't fool me said Galapas. Now I shall come for you with my shining blade and I shall see what you are, by year by nay. He came down towards them, holding the blue glittering edge in front of him, and his fat eyes were brutal and piggish in the torchlight. You can imagine that it was not very pleasant having a person who weighed 35 stone looking for you in a narrow passage with a sword as long as yourself in the hopes of sticking it in your liver. Don't be silly said Merlin, it is only a mouse or two mice, you ought to know better. It is an invisible magician said Galapas, and as for invisible magicians, I slit them up, see, I shed their bowels upon the earth, see, I rip them and tear them, see, so that their invisible guts fall out upon the earth. Now, where are you, magician, so that I may slice and zip? We are behind you said Merlin anxiously, look in that further corner behind your back. Yes said Galapas grimly, except for your voice. 
Hold on, cried Merlin, but the ward in the confusion had slipped his hand. A visible magician remarked the giant this time, but only a small one. We shall see whether the sword goes in with a slide. Catch hold, you idiot, cried Merlin frantically, and with several fumblings they were hand in hand. Gone again, said Galapas, and swiped with his sword towards where they had been. It struck blue sparks from the stones. Merlin put his invisible mouth right up to the wart's invisible ear and whispered, Lie flat in the passage. We will press ourselves one to each side and hope that he will go beyond us. This worked, but the wart, in wriggling along the floor, lost contact with his protector once again. He groped everywhere but could not find him, and of course he was now visible again, like any other person. Ha! cried Galapas, the same small one, equally visible. He made a swipe into the darkness, but Merlin had snatched his pupil's hand again and just dragged him out of danger. Mysterious chaps said the giant, the best thing would be to go snip snap along the floor. That's the way they cut up spinach, you know added the giant, or anything you have to chop small. Merlin and the wart crouched hand in hand at the furthest corner of the corridor, while the horrible giant Galapas slowly minced his way towards them, laughing from the bottom of his thunderous belly and not sparing a single inch of the ground. Click click went his razor sword upon the brutal stones, and there seemed to be no hope of rescue. He was behind them now and had cut them off. Goodbye whispered the wart. It was worth it. Goodbye said Merlin. I don't think it was at all. You may well say goodbye sneered the giant for soon this choppy blade will rip you. My dear friends shouted King Pelliner out of his cell. Don't you say goodbye at all. I think I can hear something coming. And while there is life there is hope. Ya yeah, cried the imprisoned inventor, also coming to their help. He feebly rattled the bars of his cell. You leave those persons alone, you grinsing giant, or I won't make you an unbreakable helmet, ever. What about your stays? exclaimed the next cell fiercely, to distract his attention. Fatty. I am not fat shouted Galapas stopping halfway down the passage. Yes you are replied the cell. Fatty. Fatty, shouted all the prisoners together. Fat old Galapas. Fat old Galapas cried for his mummy. He couldn't find his stays, and down fell his tummy. All right, said the giant, looking perfectly blue in the face. All right, my beauties. I'll just finish these two off, and then it will be truncheons for supper. Truncheons yourself, they answered. You leave those two alone. Truncheons was all the giant said. Truncheons and a few little thumb screws to finish up with. Now then, where are we? There was a distant noise, a kind of barking, and King Pelliner, who had been listening at his barred window while this was going on, began to jump and hop. It's it, he shouted in high delight. It's it, what's it? They asked him. It, explained the king, it, itself. While he was explaining, the noise had come nearer and now was clamoring just outside the dungeon door. Behind the giant, it was a pack of hounds. Woof, cried the door, while the giant and all his victims stood transfixed. Woof, cried the door again, and the hinges creaked. Woof, cried the door for the third time, and the hinges broke. Wow, cried the giant Galapas as the door crashed to the stone flags with a tremendous slap, and the beast Gladys and bounded into the corridor. Let go of me, you awful animal, cried the giant as the questing beast fixed its teeth into the seat of his pants. Help, help, squealed the giant as the monster ran him out of the broken door. Good old beast, yelled King Pelliner from behind his bars. Look at that, I ask you. Good old beast, Lou, 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 fetch him along then, old lady. Bring him on then, bring him on. Good old girl, bring him on, bring him on then, bring him on. Dead, dead, added King Pelliner rather prematurely. Bring him on dead, then, bring him on dead. 
There you are then, good old girl, high lost, high lost, Lou, 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 Lou. What do you know about that, for a retriever entirely self-trained? How Roof barked the questing beast in the far distance. How Roof, how Roof. And they could just hear the giant galapas running round and round the circular stairs towards the highest turret in his castle. Merlin and Wart hurriedly opened all the cell doors with the keys which the giant had dropped, though the beast would no doubt have been able to break them down if he had not, and the pathetic prisoners came out blinking in the torchlight. They were thin and bleached like mushrooms, but their spirits were not broken. Well, they said, isn't this a bit of alright? No more thumbscrews for supper. No more dungeons, no more stench, said the inventor. No more sitting on this hard bench. A wonder where he can have put my toothbrush? That's a splendid animal of yours, Pelliner. We owe her all our lives. Three cheers for Gladysant. And the brash A must be somewhere about. Oh, come along, my dear fellow. You can clean your teeth some other time with a stick or something when we get out. The thing to do is to set free all the slaves and to run away before the beast lets him out of the tower. As far as that goes, we can pinch the aperns on the way out. Lordy, I shan't be sorry to see a nice fire again. That place fair gives me the rheumatics. Let's burn all his truncheons and write what we think of him on the walls. Good old Gladysant. Three cheers for Pelliner. Three cheers for everybody else. Huzza, huzza, huzza. Merlin and the wart slipped away invisibly from the rejoicings. They left the slaves thronging out of the castle while King Pelliner carefully unlocked the iron rings from their necks with a few appropriate words, as if he were distributing the prizes on speech day. Gladysant was still making a noise like thirty couple of hounds questing outside the tower door, and Galapas, with all the furniture piled against the door, was leaning out of the tower window, shouting for the fire brigade. The occupant of cell no. 3 was busily collecting the Ascot Gold Cup and other trophies out of the giant safe while the publicity man was having a splendid time with a bonfire of truncheons, thumb screws and anything else that looked as if it would melt the instruments of torture. Across the corridor of the now abandoned dungeons, the inventor was carving a rude message with hammer and chisel, and this said, sucks to Galapas. The firelight and the cheering, and King Pelliner's encouraging remarks, such as Britons, never shall be slaves or I, hope you will never forget the lessons you have learnt, while you were with us here or I, shall always be glad to hear from any old slaves, how they get on in life or try, they make it a rule always to clean your teeth twice a day. Combined to make the leave taking a festive one, from which the two invisible visitors were sorry to depart. But time was precious, as Merlin said, and they hurried off towards the burbly water. Considering the things that had happened, there must have been something queer about time as well as its preciousness for when the ward opened his eyes in the solar K was still clicking his chessmen and Sir Ector still staring into flames. Well said Sir Ector, what about the giant? Merlin looked up from his knitting and the ward opened a startled mouth to speak, but the question had been addressed to the vicar. Reverend Sidebottom closed his book about Paulus, the son of Evander, rolled his eyeballs wildly, clutched his thin beard, gasped for breath, shut his eyes, and exclaimed hurriedly, My beloved, the giant is Adam, who was formed free from all corruption. The wound from which he died is transgression of the divine command. Then he blew out his cheeks, let go of his beard, and glanced triumphantly at Merlin. Very good said Merlin, especially that bit about remaining uncorrupted. But what about the candle and the needle? The vicar closed his eyes again, as if in pain, and all waited in silence for the explanation. 
After they had waited for several minutes, Wart said, If I were a knight in armor and met a giant, I should smite off both his legs by the knees, saying, Now art thou better of a size to deal with than thou were, and after that I should swish off his head. Hush said Sir Ector, Never mind about that. The candle said the vicar wanly is eternal punishment, extinguished by means of a needle that is by the passion of Christ. Very good indeed said Merlin, patting him on the back. The fire burnt merrily, as if it were a bonefire which some slaves were dancing round and one of the gaze hounds next to the wart now went how roof, how roof in its sleep, so that it sounded like a pack of thirty couple of hounds questing in the distance, very far away beyond the nightlit woods. Chapter 20. It was haymaking again, and Merlin had been with them a year. The wind had been, and the snow, and the rain, and the sun once more. The boys looked longer in the leg, but otherwise everything was the same. Six other years passed by. Sometimes Sir Grumnor came on a visit, sometimes King Pelliner could be descried galloping over the purlieus after the beast, or with the beast after him, if they happened to have got muddled up. Cully lost the vertical stripes of his first year's plumage and became grayer, grimmer, madder, and distinguished by smart horizontal bars where the long stripes had been. The Merlins were released every winter, and the new ones caught again next year. Hobbs' hair went white. The sergeant-at-arms developed a pot belly and nearly died of shame, but continued to cry out one-two in a huskier voice upon every possible occasion. Nobody else seemed to change at all, except the boys. They grew longer. They ran like wild colts as before, and visited Robin when they had a mind to and had innumerable adventures too lengthy to be recorded. Merlin's extra tuition went on just the same. For in those days even the grown-ups were so childish that they saw nothing uninteresting in being turned into snakes or owls, or in going invisibly to visit giants. The only difference was that now, in their fencing lessons Kay and Wart were an easy match for the pot-bellied sergeant, and paid him back accidentally for many of the buffets which he had once given them. They had more and more proper weapons given to them when they had reached their teens until in the end they had full suits of armor and bows nearly six feet long, which would fire the real clothyard shaft. You were not supposed to use a bow longer than your own height, for it was considered that by doing so you were expending unnecessary energy, rather like using an elephant gun to shoot an Avis Ammon with. At any rate, modest men were careful not to overbow themselves. It was a form of boasting. As the years went by, Kay became more difficult. He always used a bow too big for him, and did not shoot very accurately with it either. He lost his temper and challenged nearly everybody to have a fight, and in those few cases where he did actually have the fight, he was invariably beaten. Also he became sarcastic. He made the sergeant miserable by nagging about his stomach and went on at the ward about his father and mother when Sir Ector was not about. He did not seem to want to do this. It was as if he disliked it, but could not help it. The ward continued to be stupid, fond of Kay, and interested in birds. Merlin looked younger every year, which was only natural, because he was younger. Archimedes got married, and brought up several handsome families of quilly youngsters in the tower room. Sir Ector got sciatica three trees were struck by lightning, Master Twitty came every Christmas without altering a hair, Goat lost all his teeth, and could eat nothing but slops, but miraculously lived on, Master Passaloo remembered a new verse about old King Cole. The years passed regularly, and the old English snow lay as it was expected to lie sometimes with a robin redbreast in one corner of the picture, a church bell or lighted window in the other, and in the end, it was nearly time for Kay's initiation as a full-blown knight. 
Proportionately as the day became nearer, the two boys drifted apart, for Kay did not care to associate with the ward any longer on the same terms, because he would need to be more dignified as a knight, and could not afford to have his squire on intimate terms with him. The wart, who would have to be the squire, followed him about disconsolately as long as he was allowed to do so, and then went off full miserably to amuse himself alone, as best he might. He went to the kitchen, well, I am a Cinderella now he said to himself, even if I had the best of it for some mysterious reason up to the present time in our education, now I must pay for my past pleasures and for seeing all those delightful dragons, witches, unicorns, camelopards and such like. By being a mere second-rate squire and holding Kay's extra spears for him while he hoves by some well or other and jousts with all comers. Never mind, I have had a good time while it lasted and it is not such bad fun being a Cinderella when you can do it in a kitchen which has a fireplace big enough to roast an ox. And the wart looked round the busy kitchen, which was colored by the flames, till it looked much like hell with sorrowful affection. The education of any civilized gentleman in those days used to go through three stages page, squire, knight, and at any rate the ward had been through the first two of these. It was rather like being the son of a modern gentleman who has made his money out of trade, for your father started you on the bottom rung even then, in your education of manners. As a page, Ward had learnt to lay the tables with three cloths and a carpet, and to bring meat from the kitchen, and to serve Sir Ector or his guests on bended knee, with one clean towel over his shoulder, one for each visitor, and one to wipe out the basins. He had been taught all the noble arts of servility, and, from the earliest time that he could remember, there had lain pleasantly in the end of his nose the various scents of mint used to freshen the water in the ewers or of basil, chamomile, fennel, hyssop and lavender, which he had been taught to strew upon the rushy floors or of the angelica, saffron, aniseed and tarragon, which were used to spice the savories which he had to carry. So he was accustomed to the kitchen quite apart from the fact that everybody who lived in the castle was a friend of his, who might be visited on any occasion. Wart sat in the enormous firelight and looked about him with pleasure. He looked upon the long spits which he had often turned when he was smaller, sitting behind an old straw target soaked in water, so that he might not be roasted himself, and upon the ladles and spoons whose handles could be measured in yards, with which he had been accustomed to baste the meat. He watched with water in his mouth the arrangements for the evening meal a boar's head with a lemon in its jaws and split almond whiskers, which would be served with a fanfare of trumpets, a kind of pork pie with sour apple juice, peppered custard, and several bird's legs or spiced leaves sticking out of the top to show what was in it, and a most luscious looking frumenti. He said to himself with a sigh, it is not so bad being a servant after all. Still sighing, asked Merlin who had turned up from somewhere, like you were that day we went to watch King Pelliner's joust? Oh, no, said the wart, or rather, oh yes, and for the same reason. But I don't really mind, I am sure I shall make a better squire than old K would. Look at the saffron going into that frumenti, it just matches the firelight on the hands in the chimney. It is lovely said Merlin, only fools want to be great. K won't tell me said the wart, what happens when you are made a knight? He says it is too sacred. What does happen? Oh. Just a lot of fuss. You will have to undress him and put him into a bath hung with rich hangings, and then two experienced knights will turn up, probably Sir Ector will get hold of old Sir Grumnor and King Pelliner, and they will both sit on the edge of the bath and give him a long lecture about the ideals of chivalry. When they have done, they will pour some of the bath water over him and sign him with the cross, and then you will have to conduct him into a clean bed to get dry. Then you dress him up as a hermit and take him off to the chapel, and there he stays awake all night, watching his armor and saying prayers. People say it's lonely and terrible for him in this vigil. 
But it isn't at all really, because the vicar and the man who sees to the candles and an armed guard, and probably you as well, as his esquire, will have to sit up with him at the same time. In the morning you lead him off to bed to have a good sleep as soon as he has confessed and heard mass and offered a candle with a piece of money stuck into it as near the lighted end as possible and then, when all are rested, you dress him up again in his very best clothes for dinner. Before dinner you lead him into the hall with his spurs and sword all ready and King Pelliner puts on the first spur and Sir Grumwar puts on the second, and then Sir Ector girds on the sword and kisses him and smacks him on the shoulder and says, Be thou a good knight. Is that all? No, you go to the chapel again then, and Kay offers his sword to the vicar, and the vicar gives it back to him, and after that our good cook over there meets him at the door, and claims his spurs as a reward, and says I shall keep these spurs for you. And if at any time you don't behave like a true knight should do, why, I shall pop them in the soup. That is the end? Yes, except for the dinner. If I were to be made a knight said the wart, staring dreamily into the fire, I should insist upon my doing my vigil all by myself, as Hob does with his hawks, and I should pray to God to let me encounter all the evil in the world in my own person, so that if I conquered, there should be none left, while if I were defeated, it would be I who would suffer for it. That would be extremely presumptuous of you said Merlin, and you would be conquered, and you would suffer for it. I shouldn't mind, wouldn't you? Wait till it happens and see. Why do people not think, when they are grown up, as I do when I am young? Oh dear said Merlin, you are making me feel confused. Suppose you wait till you are grown up and know the reason? I don't think that is an answer at all replied the wart, pretty justly. Merlin wrung his hands. Well, anyway he said, suppose they didn't let you stand against all the evil in the world? I could ask said the wart. You could ask repeated Merlin. He thrust the end of his beard into his mouth, stared tragically in the fire, and began to munch it fiercely. Chapter 21 The day for the great ceremony drew near. The invitations to King Pelliner and Sir Grumnor were sent out, and the wart withdrew himself more and more into the kitchen. Come on, wart, old boy said Sir Ector ruefully. I didn't think you would take it so bad. It doesn't become you to do this sulkin. I am not sulking said the wart. I don't mind a bit, and I am very glad that Kay is going to be a knight. Please don't think I am sulking. You are a good boy said Sir Ector. I know you're not sulking really, but do cheer up. Kay isn't such a bad stick, you know, in his way. Kay is a splendid chap said the wart. Only I was not happy because he did not seem to want to go hawking or anything with me anymore. It's his youthfulness said Sir Ector. It will all clear up. I am sure it will said the wart, it is only that he doesn't want me to go with him just at the moment, and so, of course, I don't go, but I will go added the wart, as soon as he commands me, I will do exactly what he says, honestly, I think Kay is a good person and I am not sulking a bit. You have a glass of this canary said Sir Ector, and go and see if old Merlin can't start cheering you up. Sir Ector has given me a glass of canary said the wart and sent me to see if you can't cheer me up. Sir Ector said Merlin is a wise man. Well said the wart, what about it? The best thing for disturbances of the spirit replied Merlin, beginning to puff and blow is to learn. That is the only thing that never fails. You may grow old and trembling in your anatomies, you may lie awake at night listening to the disorder of your veins, you may miss your only love and lose your monies to a monster, you may see the world about you devastated by evil lunatics, 
or know your honor trampled in the sowers of baser minds. There is only one thing for it then, to learn. Learn why the world wags and what wags it. That is the only thing which the poor mind can never exhaust, never alienate, never be tortured by, never fear or distrust, and never dream of regretting. Learning is the thing for you. Look at what a lot of things there are to learn pure science, the only purity there is. You can learn astronomy in a lifetime, natural history in three, literature in six. And then, after you have exhausted a milliard lifetimes in biology and medicine and theocriticism and geography and history and economics, why, you can start to make a cartwheel out of the appropriate wood, or spend 50 years learning to begin to learn to beat your adversary at fencing. After that you can start again on mathematics, until it is time to learn to plow. Apart from all these things said the wart, what do you suggest for me to do just now? Let me see said the magician, considering. We have had a short six years of this, and in that time I think I am right in saying that you have been something in either animal, vegetable or mineral, something in earth, air, fire, water. I don't know much said the wart about the animals and the earth. Then the best thing is that you shall meet my friend the badger. I have never met a badger. Good said Merlin, except for dear old Archimedes, I think he is the most learned creature that I know, you will like him. By the way, Ward added the magician, stopping in the middle of his spell, there is one thing I ought to tell you, this is the last time I shall be able to turn you into anything, all the magic for that kind of thing has been used up, and this will be the end of your education. When Kay has been knighted my labors will be over. You will have to go away then, to be his squire in the wide world, and I shall go elsewhere. Do you think you have learned anything? I have learned and been happy. That's all right, then said Merlin. Try to remember what you learned. He proceeded with the spell pointed his wand of lignum vitae at the little bear, which had just begun to glow in the dimity as it hung by its tail from the north star and called out cheerfully, have a good time for the last night. Give love to Badger. The call sounded from far away and Wart found himself standing at the edge of a fallen bank in the forest savage with a big black hole in front of him. Badger lives in there he said to himself, and I am supposed to go in and talk to him, but I won't, it was bad enough never to be a knight, but now my own tutor that I found on the only quest I shall ever have is to be taken from me also, and there will be no more natural history or exciting duels with Madame Min. Very well, I will have one more night of joy before I am condemned, and, as I am a wild beast now, I will be a wild beast, and there it is. So he trundled off fiercely over the twilight snow, for it was winter. If you are feeling desperate, a badger is a good thing to be. A relation of the bears, otters and whistles, you are the nearest thing to a bear now left in England, and your skin is so thick that it makes no difference who bites you. As far as your own bite is concerned, there is something about the formation of your jaw, which makes it almost impossible to be dislocated, and so, however much the thing you are biting twists about, there is no reason why you should ever let go. You are one of the few creatures which can munch up hedgehogs quite unconcernedly. Just as you can munch up everything else from wasps' nests and roots to baby rabbits. It so happened that a sleeping hedgehog was the first thing which came in the wart's way. Hedge pig said the wart peering at his victim with blurred, short-sighted eyes, I am going to munch you up. The hedgehog, which had hidden its own bright little eye buttons and long sensitive nose inside its curl, and which had ornamented its spikes with a not very tasteful arrangement of dead leaves, before going to bed for the winter in its grassy nest, 
woke up at this and squealed most lamentably. The more you squeal said the wart, the more I shall gnash. It makes my blood boil within me. Ah, uh, Mr. Brock cried the hedgehog, holding himself tight shut. Good Mr. Brock, shoe mercy to a poor urchin, and don't e be tyrannical. I spent no common tiggy, Mr. Four to be munched and mumbled. Have mercy, kind sir, on a harmless, flea-bitten crofter which can't tell his left hand nor his right. Hedge pig said the wart remorselessly, forbear to whine, neither thrice nor once. Alas, my poor wife and children, I bet you haven't got any. Come out of that, thou tramp, and prepare to meet thy doom. Mr. Brock implored the unfortunate pig, come now, don't e be okayed, sweet Mr. Brock, my duck. Hearken to an urchin's prayer. Grant the dear boon of life to this most uncommon tiggy, lordly meester, and he shall sing to e in numbers sweet or teach e how to suck cow's milk in the pearly dew. Sing, asked the wart, stopping, quite taken aback. I, sing cried the hedgehog, and it began hurriedly to sing in a very placating manner, but rather muffled because it dared not uncurl. Oh, Genevieve it sang most mournfully into its tummy, sweet Genevieve, fair days may come, fair days may go, but still the light of memory weaves, those gentle dreams, of long ago. It also sang, without pausing for a moment between the songs, home sweet home and the old rustic bridge by the mill. Then, because it had finished all its repertoire, it drew a hurried but quavering breath and began again on Genevieve. After that, it sang home sweet home and the old rustic bridge by the mill. Come on, said the wart, you can stop that, I won't bite you. Clementius Meester whispered the hedge pig humbly, us shall bless the saints and board of governors for e, and for they most kindly chops, so long as fleas skip nor urchins climb up chimneys, then for fear that its brief relapse into prose might have hardened the tyrant's heart, it launched out breathlessly into Geneva for the third time, stop singing said the wart, for heaven's sake, uncurl, I won't do you any harm, come, you silly little urchin, and tell me where you learnt these beautiful songs? Uncurl is one word answered the porpentine tremblingly, it did not feel in the least fretful at the moment, but curling up is still another. If ye was to see my little naked nose, meester, at this despicuous moment ye might feel a twitching in thy white toothsums, and all's fear and love and war, that we do know. Let un sing to e again, sweet Meester Brock, concerning thick their rustic mill. I don't want to hear it any more. You sing it very well, but I don't want it again. Uncurl, you idiot, and tell me where you learnt to sing. Us bent no common urchin quavered the poor creature, staying curled up as tight as ever. Us wore a toque when little by one of them their gentry, like as it might be from the mother's breast. Ah. Don't e nip our tender vitals, lovely Mr. Brock for e wore a proper gentleman, e wore, and brought us up full comely on cow's milk and that, all supped out from a wardly dish. Ah, there, bent many urchins would a drunken tap water outer porcelain, that there bent. I don't know what you are talking about said the wart. E wore a gentleman cried the hedgehog desperately, like I tell e. S two on when us wore little and fed on when us hant no more. E wore a proper gentleman what fed on in tur parlor, like what no urchins hant been afore nor since fed out from gentlemen's porcelain, I and a dreary day it wore whenever us left on for naught but willfulness, that thou mayst be sure. What was the name of this gentleman? E wore a gentleman, E wore, E had a no proper name, like not like you may remember, but E wore a gentleman, that E wore, and fed on out of porcelain. Was he called Merlin? asked the wart curiously. Ah, that wore his name, a proper fine name it wore, but us never could lay a tongue to it by merry means. Ah, Mern E called to Isulf and fed on out of porcelain, like a proper fine gentleman. Oh, do uncurl exclaimed the wart. I know the man who kept you, and I think I have seen you, yourself, when you were a baby in cotton wool. Come on, urchin, I'm sorry I frightened you, 
We are friends here, and I want to see your little gray wet twitching nose just for old time's sake. Twitching nose be one meme answered the hedgehog obstinately, and a twitching of that nose be another, meester. Now you move along kind meester Brock, and leave a poor crofter to teak his winter drowse. Let you think of beetles or honey, sweet baron, and flights of angels sing me to thy rest, nonsense exclaimed the wart. I won't do you any harm, because I knew you when you were little. Ah, them badgers said the poor thing to its tummy. They go a barrowing about with no harm in their hearts, Lord bless em. But don't they fare, give you a nip without a noticing of it, and Lord bless ye, what is a retired mun to do? It's that their skin of theirs, that's which it be, which from earliest childer they've been a nipping of among each other, and also of their maws, without a feeling of anything among their souls, so natural they nips elsewhere like the seam. Now my poor gentleman, Meester Mern, they was allers a-rushing arter his ankles, with their yik yik yik, when they wanted to be fed like those would he kept from Littles and Holy Church, how he would scream. I, tis a malachy thing to deal with they badgers, that us may be sure. Don't see nothing added the hedgehog, before the wart could protest. Blunder along like to one of they ambling hearth rugs, on the outsides of their girt feet. Get in their way for a moment, just out of fortune like, without nary wicked intention and tis snip snap. Just like that, out of self-defense for the hungry blind. And then where are you? Only please us can do for uncontinued the urchin is to hit on Ontario nose. Achilles heel they meme on inter scriptures. Hit one of they girt trollops on ter nose, bim bam, like that ear, and the sharp life is fair, outer him ear he can snuffle. Tis a fair knockout, that it is. But how can a poor urchin dump an on ter nose? Concluded the lecturer mournfully, when he han't got nothing to dump with nor way to hold on. And then they comes about e and asks e for to uncurl. You needn't uncurl, said the wart resignedly. I am sorry I woke you up, chap, and I'm sorry I frightened you. I think you are a charming hedgehog, and meeting you has made me feel more cheerful again. You just go to sleep like you were when I met you, and I shall go off to look for my friend Badger, as I was told to do. Good night, urchin, and good luck in the snow. Good night, it may be muttered the pig grumpily, and then again it mayn't. First it's uncurl, and then it's curl. One thing one moment, and another thing turn next. Hey ho, tis a turby world, but good night ladies is my motter come hail come snow, and so us shall be continued in our next. With these words the humble animal curled himself up still more snugly than before, gave several squeaky grunts, and was far away in a dream world so much deeper than our human dreams, as a whole winter's sleep is longer than the mercy of a single night. Well thought the wart, he certainly gets over his trouble pretty quickly. Fancy going to sleep again as quick as that. I dare say he was never more than half awake all the time, and will think it was only a dream when he gets up properly in the spring. He watched the dirty little ball of leaves and grass and fleas for a moment curled up tightly inside its hole, then grunted and moved off towards the badger's set, following his own oblong footmarks backwards in the snow. So Merlin sent you to me said the badger to finish off your education. Well, I can only teach you two things, to dig and to love your home. These are the true end of philosophy. Would you show me your home? Certainly said the badger, though, of course, I don't use it all. It's a rambling old place, much too big for a single man. I suppose some parts of it may be a thousand years old. There are about four families of us in it, here and there, take it by and large, from cellar to attics, and sometimes we don't meet for months. A crazy old place, I suppose it must seem to you modern people, but there, it's cozy. He went ambling off down the corridors, rolling from leg to leg with that queer badger paddle, his white mask with its black stripes, looked ghostly in the gloom. It's along that passage he said, if you want to wash your hands, 
Badgers are not like foxes, they have a special midden where they put out their used bones and rubbish proper earth closets and bedrooms whose bedding they turn out frequently to keep it clean. The wart was enchanted with all he saw. He admired the great hall most for this was the central room of the whole fortification. It was difficult to know whether to think of it as a fortification or as a palace and all the various suites and bolt holes radiated outwards from it. It was a bit cobwebby owing to being a sort of common room instead of being looked after by one particular family, but it was decidedly solemn. Badger called it the combination room. All around the paneled walls there were ancient paintings of departed badgers famous in their day for scholarship or godliness, lit up from above by shaded glowworms. There were stately chairs with the badger arms stamped in gold upon their Spanish leather seats. The leather was coming off and a portrait of the founder over the fireplace. The chairs were arranged in a semicircle round the fire and there were mahogany fans with which everybody could shield their faces from the flames, and a kind of tilting board by means of which the decanters could be slid back from the bottom of the semicircle to the top. Some black gowns hung in the passage outside, and all was extremely ancient. I'm a bachelor at the moment, said the badger apologetically, when they got back to his own snug room with the flowered wallpaper, so I'm afraid there is only one chair. You will have to sit on the bed, make yourself at home, my dear, while I brew some punch, and tell me how things are going on in the wide world. Oh, they go on much the same. Merlin is very well, and Kay is to be made a knight next week. An interesting ceremony commented the badger, stirring the spirits with a big spoon. What enormous arms you have got remarked the wart, watching him. So have I for that matter. And he looked down at his own bandy-legged muscles. He was really just a tight chest holding together a pair of forearms, mighty as thighs. It's to dig with said the badger complacently. Mole and I, I suppose you would have to dig pretty quick to match with us. I met a hedgehog outside said the wart. Did you now? They say nowadays that hedgehogs can carry swine fever and foot and mouth disease. I thought he was rather nice. They do have a sort of pathetic appeal said the badger sadly. But I'm afraid I generally just munch them up. There is something irresistible about pork crackling. The Egyptians he added and by this he meant the gypsies are fond of them for eating too. Mine wouldn't uncurl. You should have pushed him into some water said the badger and then he'd have shown you his poor legs quick enough. Come, the punch is ready. Sit you down by the fire and take your ease. It's nice to sit here with the snow and wind outside. It is nice. Let us drink good luck to Kay in his knighthood. Good luck to Kay, then. Good luck. Well said the badger, setting down his glass again with a sigh. Now what could have possessed Merlin to send you to me? He was talking about learning said the wart. Ah, well, if it's learning you are after, you have come to the right shop. But don't you find learning rather dull? Sometimes I do said the wart, and sometimes I don't. On the whole I can bear a good deal of learning if it's about natural history. I am writing a treatise just now said the badger coughing diffidently to show that he was absolutely set upon explaining it, which is to point out why man has become the master of all the animals. Perhaps you would like to hear that? It's for my dealit. You know added the badger hastily, before war could protest. He got so few chances of reading his treatises to anybody, that he could not bear to let this priceless opportunity slip by. Thank you very much said the wart, it will be good for you, you know explained the badger in a humble tone, it's just the thing to top off your education, study birds and fish and animals, then finish off with man, how fortunate you came, now where the devil did I put that manuscript? The old gentleman hurriedly scratched about with his great claws until he had turned up a dirty old bundle of papers, one corner of which had been used for lighting something. 
Then he sat down in his leather armchair, which had a deep depression in the middle of it, put on his velvet smoking cap with the tassel, and produced a pair of tarantula spectacles, which he balanced on the end of his nose. Hem said the badger. He immediately became completely paralyzed with shyness and sat blushing at his papers, unable to begin. Go on, said the wart. It's not very good, explained the badger coyly. It's just a rough draft, you know. I shall alter a lot before I send it in. I am sure it must be interesting, said the wart. Oh, no. It isn't a bit interesting. It's just an odd thing I threw off in an odd half hour, just to pass the odd time, you know. But still, this is how it begins. Hem, said the badger. Then he put on an impossible high falsetto voice and began to read as fast as possible. People often ask as an idle question whether the process of evolution began with the chicken or the egg. Was there an egg out of which the first chicken came? Or did a chicken lay the first egg? I am in a position to state that the first thing created was the egg. When God had manufactured all the eggs out of which the fishes and the serpents and the birds and the mammals and even the duck-billed platypus would eventually emerge, he called the embryos before him and saw that they were good. Perhaps I ought to explain added the badger, lowering his papers nervously and looking at the ward over the top of them. That all embryos look very much the same. They are what you are before you are born, and whether you are going to be a tadpole or a peacock or a camelopard or a man, when you are an embryo, you just look like a peculiarly repulsive and helpless human being. I continue as follows. The embryo stood up in front of God, with their feeble hands clasped politely over their tummies, and their heavy heads hanging down respectfully, and God addressed them. He said, Now, you embryos, here you are, all looking exactly the same, and we are going to give you the choice of what you are going to be. When you grow up you will get bigger anyway, but we are pleased to grant you another gift as well. You may alter any parts of yourselves into anything which you think would be useful to you in afterlife. For instance, at the moment you can't dig. Anybody who would like to turn his hands into a pair of spades or garden forks is allowed to do so. Or, to put it another way, at present you can only use your mouths for eating with. Anybody who would like to use his mouth as an offensive weapon can change it by asking and be a cork and drill or a saber-toothed tiger. Now then, step up and choose your tools, but remember that what you choose you will grow into and will have to stick to. All the embryos thought the matter over politely, and then, one by one, they stepped up before the eternal throne. They were allowed two or three specializations, so that some chose to use their arms as flying machines and their mouths as weapons, or crackers, or drillers, or spoons, while others selected to use their bodies as boats and their hands as oars. We badgers thought very hard and decided to ask three boons. We wanted to change our skins for shields, our mouths for weapons, and our arms for garden forks. These boons were granted to us. Everybody specialized in one way or another, and some of us in very queer ones. For instance, one of the lizards decided to swap his whole body for blotting paper and one of the toads who lived in the Antipodes decided simply to be a water bottle. The asking and granting took up two long days they were the fifth and sixth, so far as I remember, and at the very end of the sixth day, just before it was time to knock off for Sunday, they had got through all the little embryos except one. This embryo was man. Well, our little man said God, you have waited till the last and slept on your decision, and we are sure you have been thinking hard all the time. What can we do for you? Please God said the embryo. I think that you made me in the shape which I now have for reasons best known to yourselves, and that it would be rude to change. If I am to have my choice I will stay just as I am. I will not alter any of the parts which you gave to me for other and doubtless inferior tools. 
and I will stay a defenseless embryo all my life doing my best to make unto myself a few feeble implements out of the wood, iron and other materials, which you have seen fit to put before me. If I want a boat I will endeavor to construct it out of trees, and if I want to fly, I will put together a chariot to do it for me. Probably I have been very silly in refusing to take advantage of your kind offer, but I have done my best to think it over carefully, and now hope that the feeble decision of this small innocent will find favor with yourselves. Well done exclaimed the creator in delighted tones. Here, all you embryos, come here with your beaks and what nots to look upon our first man. He is the only one who has guessed our riddle out of all of you, and we have great pleasure in conferring upon him the order of dominion over the fowls of the air, and the beasts of the earth, and the fishes of the sea. Now let the rest of you get along, and love and multiply, for it is time to knock off for the weekend. As for you, man, you will be a naked tool all your life, though a user of tools. You will look like an embryo till they bury you, but all others will be embryos before your might eternally undeveloped. You will always remain potential in our image, able to see some of our sorrows and to feel some of our joys. We are partly sorry for you, man, and partly happy, but always proud. Run along then, man, and do your best. And listen, man, before you go. Well, asked Adam turning back from his dismissal. We were only going to say said God shyly, twisting their hands together. Well, we were just going to say, God bless you. Chapter 22 King Pelliner arrived for the important weekend in a high state of flurry. A say he exclaimed, Do you know? Have you heard? Is it a secret? What? Is what a secret? What? They asked him. Why? The king cried his majesty. You know about the king? What's the matter with the king? Inquired Sir Ector. You don't say he's coming down to hunt with those damned hounds of his or anything like that? He's dead cried King Pelliner tragically, he's dead poor fella, and can't hunt anymore. Sir Grumnore stood up respectfully and took off his helm. The king is dead he said, long lied the king. Everybody else felt they ought to stand up too, and the boy's nurse burst into tears. There, there she sobbed, his loyal highness dead and gone, and him such a respectful gentleman. Nenny's the illuminated picture I've cut out of him from the illustrated missiles, I and stuck up over the mantle. From the time when he was in swaddling bands, right through the world towers till he was a visiting the dispersed areas as the world's prince charming, there wasn't a picture of him, but I had it out I and give him a last thought o' oh night. Compose yourself, Nanny said Sir Ector. It's solemn, isn't it? said King Pelliner. What? A solemn moment said Sir Grumnore. The king is dead. Long live the king. We ought to pull down the blind said Kay, who was always a stickler for good form, or half mast the banners. That's right said Sir Ector. Somebody go and tell the sergeant at arms. It was obviously the ward's duty to execute this command, for he was now the junior of all the noblemen present, and so he ran out cheerfully to find the sergeant. Soon those who were left in the solar could hear a voice crying out, Na nah then, one two, special warning for his light majesty, lower a Y on the command too. And then the flapping of all the standards, banners, pennons, pennon cells, banderols, giddens, streamers and cognizances, which made gay the snowy turrets of the forest savage. How did you hear? asked Sir Ector. A was just pricking through the purlieus of the forest after that beast, you know, when A met with a solemn friar of orders grey, and he told me, it's the very latest news. Poor old Pendragon said Sir Ector. The king is dead said Sir Grumnore solemnly, long lie the king. It's all very well for you to keep on mentioning that, 
My dear Grumlor, exclaimed King Pelliner petulantly, but who is this king, what, that is to live so long, what, according to you? Well, his heir said Sir Grumlor, rather taken aback. Our blessed monarch said the nurse tearfully, never had no hair. Anybody that studied the loyal family knowed that. Good gracious, exclaimed Sir Ector, but he must have had a next of kin? That's just it cried King Pelliner in high excitement, that's the exciting part about it, what, no hair and no next of skin, and who's to succeed to the throne, that's what my friar was so excited about, what, 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 do you mean to tell me exclaimed Sir Grumlor indignantly, that there ain't no king of England? Not a scrap of one cried King Pelliner, feeling most important, and there have been signs and wonders of no mean might. I think it's a scandal said Sir Grumlor, God knows what the dear old country is coming to, it's these Bolsheviks, no doubt. What sort of signs and wonders? asked Sir Ector. Well, there has appeared a sort of sword in a stone, what, in a sort of church, not in the church, if you see what I mean, and not in the stone, but that sort of thing, what, like you might say. I don't know what the church is coming to said Sir Grumlor. It's in an anvil explained the king. The church? No, the sword. But I thought you said the sword was in the stone? No said King Pelliner. The stone is outside the church. Look here, Pelliner said Sir Ector. You have a bit of a rest, old boy, and start again. Here, drink up this horn of mead and take it easy. The sword, said King Pelliner, is stuck through an anvil which stands on a stone. It goes right through the anvil and into the stone. The anvil is stuck to the stone. The stone stands outside a church. Give me some more mead. I don't think that's much of a wonder, remarked Sir Grumlor. What I wonder at is that they should allow such things to happen. But you can't tell nowadays, what with all these socialists. My dear fellow cried Pelliner, getting excited again, it's not where the stone is, that I'm trying to tell you, but what is written on it, what, where it is, what, why, on its pommel. Come on, Pelliner said Sir Ector. You just sit quite still with your face to the wall for a minute, and then tell us what you are talking about. Take it easy, old fruit. No need for hurrying. You sit still and look at the wall. There's a good chap, and talk as slow as you can. There are words written on this sword in this stone outside this church cried King Pelliner piteously, and these words are as follows, oh, do try to listen to me, you too, instead of interrupting all the time about nothing, for it makes a man's head go ever so. What are these words? asked Kay. These words say this said King Pelliner, so far as I can understand from that old friar of orders grey. Go on, do said Kay, for the king had come to a halt. Go on, said Sir Ector, what do these words on this sword in this anvil in this stone outside this church say? Some red propaganda, no doubt remarked Sir Grumlor. King Pelliner closed his eyes tight, extended his arms in both directions, and announced in capital letters, Woe so pulleth out the sword of the stone, and anvil is rightwise king born of all England. Who said that? asked Sir Grumlor. But the sword said it, like I tell you. Talkative weapon remarked Grumlor skeptically. It is written on it cried the king angrily. Written on it in letters of gold. Why didn't you pull it out then? asked Sir Grumlor. But I tell you that I wasn't there. All this that I am telling you was told to me by the friar I was telling you of, like I tell you. Has this sword with this inscription been pulled out? inquired Sir Ector. No, whispered King Pelliner dramatically. That's where the whole excitement comes in. They can't pull this sword out at all, although they have all been trying like fun, and so they have had to proclaim a tournament all over England for New Year's Day. So that the man who comes to the tournament and pulls out the sword can be King of England forever. What, a say? Oh, father cried Kay. The man who pulls that sword out of the stone will be the king of England. Can't we go to this tournament, father, and have a shot? Couldn't think of it, said Sir Ector. 
Long way to London, said Sir Grumnor, shaking his head. My father went there once, said King Pelliner. Kay said, Oh, surely we could go. When I am knighted I shall have to go to a tournament somewhere, and this one happens at just the right date. All the best people will be there, and we should see the famous knights and great kings. It doesn't matter about the sword, of course, but think of the tournament, probably the greatest there has ever been in England, and all the things we should see and do. Dear father, let me go to this tourney, if you love me, so that I may bear away the prize of all, in my maiden fight. But Kay said Sir Ector, I have never been to London, all the more reason to go. I believe that anybody who doesn't go for a tournament like this will be proving that he has no noble blood in his veins. Think what people will say about us if we don't go and have a shot at that sword. They will say that Sir Ector's family was too vulgar and knew it had no chance. We all know the family has no chance, said Sir Ector, that is, for the sword. A lot of people in London remark Sir Grummore with a mild surmise. So, they say. He took a deep breath and goggled at his host with eyes like marbles. And shops added King Pelliner suddenly, also beginning to breathe heavily. Dang it, cried Sir Ector, bumping his horn mug on the table, so that it spilled. Let's all go to London, then, and see the new king. They rose up as one man. Why shouldn't they be as good a man as my father? exclaimed King Pelliner. Dash it all, cried Sir Grumnore. After all, damn it all, it is the capital. Hooray, shouted Kay. Lord have mercy, said the nurse. At this moment the wart came in with Merlin, and everybody was too excited to notice that, if he had not now been grown up, he would have been on the verge of tears. Oh, wart cried Kay, forgetting for the moment that he was only addressing his squire, and slipping back into the familiarity of their boyhood. What do you think? We are all going to London for a great tournament on New Year's Day, are we? Yes, and you will carry my shield and spears for the jousts, and I shall win the palm off everybody, and be a great knight. Well, I am glad we are going, said the wart, for Merlin is leaving us too. Oh, we shan't need Merlin. He is leaving us, repeated the wart. Leaving us? asked Sir Ector. I thought it was we that were leaving. He is going away from the forest savage, Sir Ector said, Oh, come now, Merlin, what's all this about? I don't understand all this a bit. I have come to say goodbye, Sir Ector said the old magician. Tomorrow my pupil Kay will be knighted, and the next week my other pupil will go away as his squire. I have outlived my usefulness here, and it is time to go. No, no, don't say that, said Sir Ector. I think you're a jolly useful chap whatever happens. You just stay here and teach me, or be the librarian or something. Don't you leave an old man alone after the children have flown. We shall all meet again, said Merlin. There is no cause to be sad. Don't go, said Kay. I must go, replied their tutor. We have had a good time while we were young but it is in the nature of time to fly. There are many things in other parts of the kingdom which I ought to be attending to just now, and it is a specially busy time for me. Come, Archimedes, say goodbye to the company. Goodbye, said Archimedes tenderly to the wart. Goodbye, said the wart without looking up at all. But you can't go, cried Sir Ector, not without a month's notice. Can't I, replied Merlin, taking up the position always assumed by philosophers who propose to dematerialize. He stood on his toes while Archimedes held tight to his shoulder, began to spin on them slowly like a top, spun faster and faster till he was only a blur of grayish light, and in a few seconds there was no one there at all. Goodbye, Wart cried two faint voices outside the solar window. Goodbye said the wart for the last time, and the poor fellow went quickly out of the room. Chapter 23 
The nighting took place in a whirl of preparations. Kay's sumptuous bath had to be set up in the box room, between two towel horses and an old box of selected games, which contained a worn-out straw dart board, it was called a flechette in those days, because all the other rooms were full of packing. The nurse spent the whole time constructing new warm pants for everybody on the principle that the climate of any place outside the forest savage must be treacherous to the extreme and, as for the sergeant, he polished all the armor till it was quite brittle and sharpened the swords till they were almost worn away. At last it was time to set out. Perhaps, if you happen not to have lived in the old England of the 12th century, or whenever it was, and in a remote castle on the borders of the marches at that, you will find it difficult to imagine the wonders of their journey. The road or track ran most of the time along the high ridges of the hills or downs, and they could look down on either side of them upon the desolate marches where the snowy reeds sighed and the ice crackled, and the duck in the red sunsets quacked loud on the winter air. The whole country was like that. Perhaps there would be a moory marsh on one side of the ridge and a forest of 30,000 acres on the other with all the great branches weighted in white. They could sometimes see a wisp of smoke among the trees or a huddle of buildings far out among the impassable reeds, and twice they came to quite respectable towns which had several inns to boast of, but on the whole it was an England without civilization. The better roads were cleared of cover for a bow shot on either side of them, lest the traveller should be slain by hidden thieves. They slept where they could, sometimes in the hut of some cottager who was prepared to welcome them, sometimes in the castle of a brother knight who invited them to refresh themselves, sometimes in the firelight and fleas of a dirty little hovel with a bush tied to a pole outside it. This was the signboard used at that time by inns and once or twice on the open ground, all huddled together for warmth between their grazing chargers. Wherever they went and whenever they slept, the east wind whistled in the reeds and the geese went over high in the starlight, honking at the stars. London was full to the brim. If Sir Ector had not been lucky enough to own a little land in Pie Street, on which there stood a respectable inn, they would have been hard put to it to find a lodging. But he did own it and as a matter of fact drew most of his dividends from this source, so that they were able to get three beds between the five of them. They thought themselves fortunate. On the first day of the tournament, Sir Kay managed to get them on the way to the lists at least an hour before the jousts could possibly begin. He had lain awake all night, imagining how he was going to beat the best barons in England, and he had not been able to eat his breakfast. Now he rode at the front of the cavalcade with pale cheeks, and Wart wished there was something he could do to calm him down. For country people who only knew the dismantled tilting ground of Sir Ector's castle, the scene which now met their eyes was really ravishing. It was a huge green pit in the earth, about as big as the arena at a football match. It lay about 10 feet lower than the surrounding country, with sloping banks, and all the snow had been swept off it. It had been kept warm with straw, which had been cleared off that morning, and now all the close mown grass sparkled green in the white landscape. Round the arena there was a world of color so dazzling and moving and twinkling as to make you blink your eyes. The wooden grandstands were painted in scarlet and white. The silk pavilions of famous people, pitched on every side, were azure and green and saffron and checkered. The pennons and pennon cells which floated everywhere in the sharp wind were flapping with every color of the rainbow as they strained and slapped at their flagpoles, and the barrier down the middle of the arena itself was done in chessboard squares of black and white. Most of the combatants and their friends had not yet arrived, but you could see from those few who had arrived how the very people would turn the scene into a bank of flowers, and how the armor would flash, and the scalloped sleeves of the heralds jig in the wind as they raised their brazen trumpets to their lips to shake the fleecy clouds of winter with joyances and fanfares. Good heavens, cried Sir Kay. 
I have left my sword at home, can't joust without a sword said Sir Grunmore, quite irregular, better go and fetch it said Sir Ector, you have time, my squire will do said Sir Kay, what a damned mistake to make, here, squire, ride hard back to the inn and fetch my sword, you shall have a shilling if you fetch it in time, the wart went as pale as Sir Kay was, and looked as if he were going to strike him, then he said, it shall be done, master, and turned his stupid little ambling palfrey against the stream of newcomers, he began to push his way towards their hostelry as best he might, to offer me money, cried the wart to himself, to look down at this beastly little donkey affair off his great charger, and call me squire, Oh, Merlin, give me patience with the brute and stop me from throwing his filthy shilling in his face. When he got to the inn it was closed. Everybody had thronged out to see the famous tournament, and the entire household had followed after the mob. Those were lawless days, and it was not safe to leave your house or even to go to sleep in it, unless you were certain that it was impregnable. The wooden shutters bolted over the downstairs windows were two inches thick, and the doors were double barred. Now what do I do said the wart to earn my shilling. He looked ruefully at the little blind inn and began to laugh. Poor Kay he said, all that shilling stuff was only because he was scared and miserable, and now he has good cause to be. Well, he shall have a sword of some sort if I have to break into the Tower of London. How does one get hold of a sword? He continued, where can I steal one? Could I waylay some knight even if I am mounted on an ambling pad and take his weapons by force? There must be some swordsmith or armorer in a great town like this whose shop would be still open. He turned his mount and cantered off along the street. There was a quiet churchyard at the end of it, with a kind of square in front of the church door. In the middle of the square there was a heavy stone with an anvil on it, and a fine new sword was struck through the anvil. Well said the wart, I suppose it's some sort of war memorial, but it will have to do. I am quite sure nobody would grudge K a war memorial if they knew his desperate straits. He tied his reins round a post of the lich gate, strode up the gravel path, and took hold of the sword. Come, sword, he said. I must cry your mercy and take you for a better cause. This is extraordinary, said the wart. I feel queer when I have hold of this sword and I notice everything more clearly. Look at the beautiful gargoyles of this church and of the monastery which it belongs to. See how splendidly all the famous banners in the aisle are waving. How nobly that you holds up the red flakes of its timbers to worship God. How clean the snow is. I can smell something like featherfew and sweet briar. And is that music I hear? It was music, whether of pan pipes or of recorders, and the light in the churchyard was so clear, without being dazzling, that you could have picked a pin out twenty yards away. There is something in this place, said the wart. There are people here. Oh, people, what do you want? Nobody answered him, but the music was loud and the light beautiful. People cried the wart. I must take this sword. It is not for me, but for Kay. I will bring it back. There was still no answer, and Wart turned back to the sword. He saw the golden letters on it, which he did not read, and the jewels on its pommel flashing in the lovely light. Come, sword, said the Wart. He took hold of the handles with both hands and strained against the stone. There was a melodious consort on the recorders, but nothing moved. The wart let go of the handles when they were beginning to bite into the palms of his hands and stepped back from the anvil, seeing stars. It is well fixed, said the wart. He took hold of it again and pulled with all his might. The music played more and more excitedly, and the lights all about the churchyard glowed like amethysts, but the sword still stuck. 
Oh, Merlin cried the wart, help me to get this sword. There was a kind of rushing noise, and a long cord played along with it. All round the churchyard there were hundreds of old friends. They rose over the church wall altogether, like the punch and judy ghosts of remembered days, and there were otters and nightingales and vulgar crows and hares and serpents and falcons and fishes and goats and dogs, and dainty unicorns and newts and solitary wasps and goat moth caterpillars and corkindrills and volcanoes and mighty trees and patient stones. They loomed round the church wall, the lovers and helpers of the wart, and they all spoke solemnly in turn. Some of them had come from the banners in the church where they were painted in heraldry, some from the waters in the sky and the fields about, but all, down to the smallest true mouse, had come to help on account of love. Wart felt his power grow. Remember my biceps said the oak which can stretch out horizontally against gravity when all the other trees go up or down. Put your back into it said a loose or pike off one of the heraldic banners, like you did once when I was going to snap you up. Remember that all power springs from the nape of the neck. What about those forearms asked a badger gravely, that are held together by a chest? Come along, my dear embryo, and find your tool. A merlin sitting on the top of the yew tree cried out, now then Captain Wart. What is the first law of foot? I thought I once heard something about never letting go. Don't work like a stalling woodpecker urged a tawny owl affectionately. Keep up a steady effort, my duck, and you will have it yet. Kohir set a stone in the church wall. A snake, slipping easily along the coping which bounded the holy earth, said, Now then, Wart, if you were once able to walk with three hundred ribs at once, surely you can coordinate a few little muscles here and there, make everything work together, as you have been learning to do ever since God let the amphibia crawl out of the sea. Fold your powers together with the spirit of your mind, and it will come out like butter. Come along, homo sapiens, for all we humble friends of yours are waiting to cheer. The wart walked up to the great sword for the third time. He put out his right hand softly and drew it out as gently as from a scabbard. There was a lot of cheering, a noise like a hurdy-gurdy which went on and on. In the middle of this noise, after a very long time, he saw Kay and gave him the sword. The people at the tournament were making a frightful row. But this isn't my sword, said Sir Kay. It was the only one I could get said the wart. The inn was locked. It is a nice looking sword. Where did you get it? I found it stuck in a stone outside a church. Sir Kay had been watching the tilting nervously, waiting for his turn. He had not paid much attention to his squire. That's a funny place to find a sword he said. Yes, it was stuck through an anvil. What? cried Sir Kay, suddenly rounding upon him. Did you just say this sword was stuck in a stone? It was said the wart. It was a sword of war memorial. Sir Kay stared at him for several seconds in amazement, opened his mouth, shut it again, licked his lips, then turned his back and plunged through the crowd. He was looking for Sir Ector, and the wart followed after him. Father cried Sir Kay, come here a moment. Yes, my boy said Sir Ector. Splendid falls these professional chaps do manage. Why, what's the matter Kay? You look as white as a sheet. Do you remember that sword which the King of England would pull out? Yes. Well, here it is. I have it. It is in my hand. I pulled it out. Sir Ector did not say anything silly. He looked at Kay and he looked at the wart. Then he stared at Kay again long and lovingly and said, We will go back to the church. Now then, Kay he said, when they were at the church door. He looked at his firstborn again kindly, but straight between the eyes. Here is the stone, and you have the sword. It will make you the King of England. You are my son that I am proud of and always will be, whatever happens. Will you promise me that you took it out by your own might? Kay looked at his father. He also looked at the wart and at the sword. Then he handed the sword to the wart quite quietly. He said, I am a liar. Wart pulled it out. 
As far as the wart was concerned, there was a time after this in which Sir Ector kept telling him to put the sword back into the stone which he did, and in which Sir Ector and Kay then vainly tried to take it out. The wart took it out for them, and stuck it back again once or twice. After this, there was another time which was more painful, he saw that his dear guardian Sir Ector was looking quite old and powerless, and that he was kneeling down with difficulty on a gouty old knee. Sir said poor old Sir Ector, without looking up, although he was speaking to his own boy. Please don't do this, father said the wart, kneeling down also. Let me help you up, Sir Ector, because you are making me unhappy. Nay, nay, my lord said Sir Ector, with some very feeble old tears. I was never your father nor of your blood, but I woke well. Ye are of an higher blood than I when ye were. Plenty of people have told me you are not my father said the wart, but it doesn't matter a bit. Sir said Sir Ector humbly, will ye be my good and gracious lord, when ye are king? Don't, said the wart. Sir said Sir Ector, I will ask no more of you, but that you will make my son, your foster brother, Sir Kay, seneschal of all your lands. Kay was kneeling down too, and it was more than the wart could bear. Oh, do stop he cried, of course he can be seneschal, if I have got to be this king, and, oh, father, don't kneel down there like that, because it breaks my heart. Please get up, Sir Ector, and don't make everything so horrible. Oh dear, oh dear, I wish I had never seen that filthy sword at all. And the ward also burst into tears. Chapter 24 Perhaps there ought to be one more chapter about the coronation. The barons naturally kicked up a dreadful fuss. But as the wart was preparing to go on putting the sword in the stone and pulling it out again till doomsday, and as there was nobody else who could do the thing at all, in the end they had to give in. A few revolted, who were quelled later, but in the main the people of England were glad to settle down. The coronation was a splendid memory, and, what was still more splendid, it was like a birthday or Christmas day. Everybody sent presents to the ward for his prowess in having learned to pull swords out of stones, and several burghers of the City of London asked him to help them in taking stoppers out of unruly bottles, unscrewing taps which had got stuck, and in other household emergencies which had got beyond their control. The dog boy and what clubbed together and sent him a mixture for the distemper, which contained quinine and was absolutely priceless. Goat sent him a watch chain plated out of his own beard. Cavill came quite simply and gave him his heart and soul. The nurse of the forest savage sent a cough mixture, 30 dozen handkerchiefs all marked, and a pair of combinations with a double chest. The sergeant sent him his medals to be preserved in the British Museum. Hob lay awake in agony all night and sent off Cully with brand new white leather jesses, silver varbles and silver bell. Robin and Marion went out on an expedition which took them six weeks and sent a whole gown made out of the skins of pine martens. Little John added a yew bow, seven feet long, which he was quite unable to draw. An anonymous hedgehog sent four or five dirty leaves with some fleas on them. The questing beast and King Pelliner put their heads together and sent some of their most perfect fumits, all wrapped up in the green leaves of spring in a golden horn with a red velvet baldric. Sir Grummore sent a gross of spears, with the old school crest on all of them. The vicar chose a work called De Clericali Disciplina, attributed to Petrus Alphonsus, which would be read at nights, and did not have to be explained. The cooks, tenants, villains and retainers of the castle of the forest Savage, who were all given an angel each and sent up for the ceremony in a cherubink at Sir Ector's charge, brought an enormous silver model of Cal Crumbuck, 
who had won the championship for the third time, and Ralph Pasalu to sing at the coronation banquet, Archimedes sent his own great-great-grandson, so that he could sit on the back of the king's throne at dinner, and make messes in the soup. The Lord Mayor and Aldermen of the City of London subscribed for a spacious aquarium muse cum menagerie in which all the creatures were starved one day a week for the good of their stomachs and here, for the fresh food, good bedding, constant attention, and every modern convenience, all the warts' friends resorted in their old age, on wing and foot and fin, for the sunset of their happy lives. The citizens of London sent £50 million to keep the menagerie up, and the ladies of Britain constructed a pair of black velvet carpet slippers, with the wart's initials embroidered on in gold. Kay sent his own record Scythian, with honest love. There were many other tasteful presents from various barons, archbishops, princes, landgraves, tributary kings, corporations, popes, sultans, royal commissions, urban district councils, czars, bays, mahatmas, and so forth, but the nicest present of all was sent most affectionately by his own guardian, Sir Ector. This present was a dunce's cap, rather like a pharaoh's serpent, which you lit at the top end. The wart lit it and watched it grow. When the flame had quite gone out, Merlin was standing before him in his magic hat. Well, wart said Merlin, here we are or were again. How nice you look in your crown. I was not allowed to tell you before or since, but your father was or will be King Uther Pendragon, and it was I myself, disguised as a beggar, who first carried you to Sir Ector's castle in your golden swaddling bands. I know all about your birth and parentage and who gave you your real name. I know the sorrows before you, and the joys, and how there will never again be anybody who dares to call you by the friendly name of Wart. In future it will be your glorious doom to take up the burden and to enjoy the nobility of your proper name. So now I shall crave the privilege of being the very first of your subjects to address you with it, as my dear liege Lord King Arthur. Will you stay with me for a long time? asked the wart, not understanding much of this. Yes, wart said Merlin, or rather, as I should say, or is it of said, yes King Arthur, the beginning. Did King Arthur actually exist? There is evidence that a powerful warrior called Arthur may have lived between AD 367 and AD 634, a time when tribes from Europe were invading Britain. Early references name Arthur as a great soldier or chieftain living in the 5th or 6th century, who may have fought off warring Anglo-Saxon invaders. The story of the Battle of Mount Baden, where both Arthur and Mordred may have been killed, is not written about until 300 years later. Arthur's exploits as the leader of chivalric knights questing for the Holy Grail and creator of the Round Table, were added much later, in the Middle Ages. T. H. White's version of King Arthur's family tree in The Queen of Air and Darkness shows Arthur as the son of Uther Pendragon and Igraine, and as the father of Mordred. Other writers say that Mordred is Arthur's son with Morgan Le Fay, or even Arthur's nephew, warrior, chieftain, king, father or uncle, Arthur still remains an heroic figure in all the different versions of this tale. Why was the table round? Although King Arthur was seen as the head of the round table, its shape signifies that no one knight is more important than another all were seen as equal in Arthur's court. Who were the knights of the round table? Only the most chivalrous of knights earned a place at the round table. The number of knights varies from 12 to 150, depending on which version of the King Arthur legend you read. Sir Ector and Sir Kay were thought to have been two of the knights of the round table, as were Arthur's nephews, Sir Gawain, Sir Agravain, Sir Gaharis and Sir Gareth. Some of the more recognizable knights include Sir Lancelot and his son Sir Galahad. Where can you see a version of the round table? A round table, with seating for 25 knights, has been hanging on the walls of Winchester Castle for over 600 years. Although it not old enough to be the original round table of the King Arthur legends, its existence shows what a powerful symbol it became. 
built by order of King Edward I in 1290, the legs were removed by order of his grandson, King Edward III, in 1348, when the table was then hung on the wall. Two centuries later, King Henry VIII had the table painted. Visit Winchester Castle or go online to see this 13th century version of the round table. www.cityofwinchester.co.uk slash history slash html slash castle.html The wart lives in the castle of the forest Savage, but what was it like? Here are some of the parts of the castle and how they are used for defense against attackers. The Barbican a well-built defensive tower located at the entrance of the castle. This would be a good place to throw heavy objects like rocks at your enemy. The drawbridge, made of wood and built over a motor of very deep ditch, the drawbridge is hinged at one end so that it can be pulled up in front of the portcullis. Once the drawbridge is up, any attacker has to swim across the moat, and that's not easy when you are wearing armor. The portcullis, a very heavy gate made of wood or metal that slides vertically up and down to close off the castle entrance. You could poke your sword and spear through holes in the portcullis to stop the enemy from getting too close. Towers and Bartisans Towers and Bartisans, small hanging turrets, are the best place from which to fire arrows through narrow slits in the wall and pour vats of boiling oil on the enemy. If all this fails, and the enemy gets through all these defenses, retreating to the inner shell keep, also called a stronghold, is a good option. There were no supermarkets in Arthurian times and no produce imported from abroad, so where did the food come from? Landowners, large and small, had to grow their own food, and if the weather wasn't good, the people went hungry. Although potatoes and tomatoes are grown in Britain today, they were not available at the time of King Arthur, that's no chips and no tomato ketchup. Oh, and no chocolate as well. A typical feast in Sir Ector's castle would include the following food. How much of it would you eat? A boar's head everything got eaten, even the ears. A large pork pie served with sour apple juice, peppered custard, bird's legs or spiced leaves. Luscious frumenty porridge made from wheat and milk, sweetened with spices. Why don't you grow some of the food the wart would have eaten? Try strawberries, raspberries, and blackberries, which don't take up a lot of room. Plant an apple or pear tree if your garden is bigger, or rent an allotment near you. Star, once you've grown your own food, why don't you have a feast to celebrate? Boar's head optional. Remember never eat wild mushrooms as some of them are poisonous. Watch out for wild berries, too, and don't eat anything without checking it out first. The ward is destined to be a great king, but what other jobs could he have had if he wasn't so lucky? Carpets were very expensive, so they were laid on tables, not on the floor. The name Pendragon means Chief Dragon, and the ward encounters many fabulous creatures including the Ale, a horse with an elephant's trunk, and King Pelliner's questing beast, Beast Gladison, which has the head of a serpent, body of a leopard, haunches of a lion, and the feet of heart. The following are all names T.H. White uses for animals, but what are they really? Merlin or Merlin is thought to have been the son of a devil and a mortal woman who, in the sword in the stone, lives his life backwards, giving him great knowledge of what will happen to the wart. Merlin has the power to change the wart into animals of earth, a badger, the air, a bird, and the water, a pike, but he has a more important role in shaping the destinies of Uther Pendragon and King Arthur. There are also stories of Merlin using his magic to bring the great stones of Stonehenge to England from Ireland, but he is not the only source of magic in the once and future king. Arthur's mythical sword and its scabbard are attributed with magical powers. In some legends the scabbard had the power to heal blood loss of the person using the sword, and the brightness of the sword would blind Arthur's enemies. Some writers name the sword Arthur pulls from the stone as Excalibur, but others say that these are two different swords, 
and that Arthur was given Excalibur by the Lady of the Lake after he breaks his original sword during a fight. Moments before Arthur's death, Excalibur is returned to Lady of the Lake once more. Excalibur may have had writing engraved on its blade, but there is no definitive description. What do you think Excalibur looked like?